A dangerous day on Atlanta roadways after a police chase turns deadly. Then, a deadly shooting shuts down parts of Interstates 285 and I-20. I thought it was like any other hospital. You can just bill me later type, and it was not. An Atlanta man now safe at home after a horrifying health scare, followed by a nightmarish hospital stay in Mexico. His warning for other travelers. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Everyone, we begin tonight with good news about former President Carter. He is 95 years of age, you know that. He was released from the hospital in Plains, and he was being treated for a urinary tract infection. He's been out of the hospital several times this year, in and out, and recently underwent surgery at Emory University for a brain bleed after falling multiple times in the past few months. Stay with 11alive.com for any updates from the Carter Center. Two major traffic incidents in Atlanta's west side just hours apart from each other. Here's what we know. Three people have both died in these incidents. 11 Alive's Elwin Lopez is following both stories for us tonight, live from Atlanta Police Headquarters. Elwin? Yeah, Jeff, a man was shot in the chest while in his car on I-285 southbound, I-20 eastbound. Officers say the alleged shooter was in a separate car and is believed to have called the police around 4 p.m. and remained on the scene until they arrived. At this point, police tell us they don't know what led up to that shooting. Right now, we're not able to confirm whether you know or not that it was, in fact, a road rage incident. But, of course, it is a possibility. And just 10 miles away, two hours apart near the west side wall, officers say two innocent people were killed when an armed carjacking led to a police chase. A horrific scene, a crash that was captured by a viewer right after it happened. Police tell me the two victims were killed when the two 19-year-old suspects crashed into their car during the chase. Officers say that happened when they ran a red light at Campbellton Road and Lee Street. Well, this was a pursuit. I mean, it does fall within our uh, standard operating procedure. We don't chase everyone. We're very strict on who we allow our officers to chase. In this case, since the vehicle was taken by gunpoint, it was a carjacking. We did allow the chase to continue. And police say the suspects in both cases are currently in police custody and are expected to face charges. Jeff. Elvin, thank you. Another deadly crash, this one in Gwinnett County. And it involved a school bus. Police say the driver in the other car was killed. Video from the 11 Alive Sky Tracker shows a lot of front end damage to the bus. Now, this happened near Puckett's Mill Road in Hamilton Mill, we're told, who was carrying special education students from Ivy Creek Elementary School. None of the children were hurt. The bus driver and the monitor are okay. Police are looking into whether the other driver was suffering from some type of medical emergency. A couple relieved to be at home tonight after getting stuck in a private Mexican hospital for weeks. A cruise trip turned into a medical emergency with the hospital requiring the couple to pay up entirely before they could leave. But they couldn't afford the $16,000 bill, that is, until a famous Georgian stepped in to help. Caitlin Ross is the only reporter in time speaking with the couple now that they're out of the hospital once again. The last picture Stephen and Tori have of themselves smiling is from the plane ride. As soon as I was on the ship, I was not feeling well. The day they boarded the ship, Stephen got so sick, the cruise line had to fly him to a private hospital in Progreso, Mexico. It was only after getting treatment for a week, they found out he owed the full amount up front. They brought him the bill of $14,000 mm -hmm. and said, you know, you don't pay, you don't leave. The couple says the hospital confiscated their passports and things got physical when they tried to leave. They literally assaulted him. Please tell them how far you walked. Oh, it was like, it was a total of six miles. In flip-flops. The hospital told NBC News it's standard for private hospitals to collect payment at the time of service, and they didn't do anything wrong. These people are really serious. Stephen's fiance Tori, put their plea on Facebook, where thousands of people reacted to their story. Without Tori, I'll probably still be in Mexico. I wouldn't have reached out to Facebook. But it was one particular viewer who made the difference. Tyler Perry saw the couple struggle and reached out directly to pay their bill. I think I repeated his name about 15 times. I couldn't believe it at all. Perry paid $16,000 to get the couple home and covered their airfare. They both say they are so thankful for Perry's generosity and kindness and for each other. I had to pull up my bootstraps and be, and be his rock. You know, for so long he's been mine, you know, now it's time for me to be his. 
I know they're so glad to be back here. The couple says that even after all of this, they would go back to Mexico, but not without international travelers insurance. We'll have much more on that coming up tonight at nine with Ron and Aisha. We have up in the live storm trackers have been tracking the temperatures today and you know we warmed up 11 degrees over where we were yesterday. Yesterday we were at 49 degrees and we cooled down into the mid 30s overnight last night. So it was a cool start to the day, but then we rebounded all the way up to 60 degrees this afternoon. So a few degrees above average, not too bad at all. So we're looking at those temperatures today that peaked out in the low 60s in Athens and in Eatonton. We were at 63 in Thomaston and in Peachtree City, 62 in the Grain. A little cooler in Carrollton with 57 degrees and they made it up to 61 in Dalton and Rome today. So really nice day all across North Georgia and tomorrow I think will be just as nice and slightly warmer. We should make it up to 62 after a morning low of 37. So still a cool start but a nice mild finish and then temperatures uh, will be getting cooler over the course of the weekend. So enjoy that Thursday with a 10 on the wasometer. So a gradual warm up is going to continue. Uh, showers will return on our Friday for Canathon. We'll have more on the timing of that coming up. Topping tonight's speed feed, a former officer has pleaded not guilty to choking a former NFL player during a traffic stop. In June, a grand jury indicted former Henry County officer David Rose on charges of violating his oath, civil battery, and making a false statement. Former NFL player Desmond Morrow claims Rose and another officer tackled him and choked him while he was handcuffed. Rose was later fired. The department says it's because his report of what happened didn't match what they saw in the video. A drug trafficker is facing up to 25 years in prison following a major bust in Cobb County. Florentino Hernandez Jr. was convicted on several charges. Police say they found more than 15 pounds of meth and a loaded gun after pulling him over in 2016. The drugs had a street value of around $120,000. Police still looking for one person in a chase that stretched from Clayton County to DeKalb County before the suspects crashed. Two people were taken into custody yesterday afternoon while a third threw himself from the car near I-285 while it was going more than 100 miles per hour. He is in serious condition at a hospital. A fourth person in the car got away. No one will fight harder for our state, for our nation, for our president, and for our conservative values. Because here's the thing. Contrary to what you might see in the media, not every strong American woman is a liberal. Many of us are conservatives and proud of it. Businesswoman Kelly Leffler is Governor Brian Kemp's appointee for the U.S. Senate. Today she introduced herself to Georgia, addressing skepticism and criticism right off the bat, saying she is in line with President Trump's agenda. This was the first time anybody has heard from Ms. Leffler, so there is... A lot to unpack. She was very specific in addressing the conservative pushback point by point and her support of President Trump as well. Doug Richards has more. Our next U.S. Senator, Kelly Leffler. She is on the tall side, admittedly soft spoken. Politically, she is a blank slate. But Kelly Leffler's story emerged in an overcrowded room at the state capitol with a national audience watching. I'm a defender of the American dream and of American ideals. I want to fight socialism side by side with President Trump. Leffler talked up conservatism, saying she's pro-life, pro-economic freedom, and pro-Donald Trump. The president had tried to talk Governor Kemp into appointing Congressman Doug Collins instead to the U.S. Senate seat to be vacated this month by Johnny Isaacson. And Collins had backing from talk show host Sean Hannity and Atlanta Tea Party founder Debbie Dooley, who talked to us last week. I think what would play in the hands of the Democrats would be for him to appoint Kelly Loeffler. Folks like me will refuse to vote for her, period. Really? Yes, really. But Kemp and other backers urged critics to get to know Loeffler before judging her. Settle down, learn the truth and the facts, and really see how strong uh, this woman is and what a great job she's going to do for us in Washington, D.C. My name is Kelly Loeffler. I'm a devoted wife a proud patriot and a devout Christian. Leffler told the room she'd grown up on a farm and waited tables before she got into the financial industry and married Jeff Sprecher, who is reportedly worth a half billion dollars and owns the New York Stock Exchange. It's that waitress that's looking to go from waiting tables to working in industry or doing whatever she wants to do in life. I want to make sure we keep that path clear and keep socialism back and and live 
what we're living right now and preserve it and build on it. Doug Richards reporting for us tonight. And now we continue to follow the saga of President Trump's issue as today's announcement coming as Congressman Collins taking a fiery stance for Republicans, blasting Democrats during the president's impeachment hearing. We're digging more into this a little bit later in the broadcast, also on 11 Alive News in prime time. In the meantime, you can read more reaction about the governor's Senate pick on 11alive.com and the 11 Alive app. A sophisticated million-dollar robbery lands an Atlanta man in prison. Tonight, the inside job he used to pull off the high-end scheme. That's straight ahead. And they're the team that many of us, including myself, love. But do you know how they got their name? Our Why Guy explains the reason the University of Georgia is associated with Bulldogs next. And don't forget, as always, we are streaming right now live on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Please join us, subscribe, and join the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news in primetime coming up after the break. Jewelry thieves going into stores, guns drawn, smashing through those glass cases and walking out with precious stones and other expensive items. Well, an Atlanta man now is going to prison, and this for a different kind of diamond heist. As Hope Ford explains, he used an insider technique to trick more than a dozen jewelry dealers. How many times have you heard this statement? If you have concern about something, pick up the phone and call. Call your local law enforcement. Well, a suspicious feeling is what led to the unraveling of a two-year, elaborate million-dollar diamond ripoff. A jewelry store in Tennessee received a package containing $150,000 in diamonds, but the owner never placed an order for the jewels. He called police, and this man, Corey Smith, was arrested. Smith was using something known in the jewelry business called memo transactions. Wholesalers send diamonds to jewelry dealers who only pay for the merchandise once it's sold. It's like consignment. Smith figured this out and posed as a jewelry retailer, ordering diamonds and having them shipped to stores in Atlanta, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Virginia. He got the tracking numbers and then had runners intercept the packages. In all, he received more than half a million dollars in jewels and defrauded wholesalers of over $1.2 million. Well, Smith was sentenced to seven years in prison. He'll have to pay half a million dollars in restitution once he is released from jail in 2027. 
Yeah, just a few high thin fair weather clouds out there today. High cirrus clouds, those mare's tail types of clouds. And our 11 and live storm tracker, Brandy Ruff, captured this picture in Cherokee County right before sunset. So a really nice way to wrap up the day where we made it all the way up to 60 degrees. So that was 11 degrees warmer than we were yesterday. That was after morning low of 35. So we started out a little chilly, uh, four degrees below average, and we ended up being a few degrees above average. And rainfall, boy, we need it. We have a deficit right now of seven and three quarters inches of rain. So we really do need the rain that's coming. We'll see a little bit on Friday and then we'll see a lot more starting on Sunday and then picking up Monday and the Tuesday of next week. So right now, what a pattern. High pressure's in control. It's really quiet. And our system that's going to move in on Friday, on Kenneth on Friday, is all the way out in the southwest. But it's going to be heading in our direction. So there's that nice dome of high pressure. Thursday morning, 9 a.m., looking really good for the first half of the day. No problems with that morning commute or the evening commute. Heading into Kenneth on time. That's going to be, we're going to go on air at 4.30. We'll be covering our annual food drive in conjunction with the Salvation Army, and I think we're just going to have some clouds out there. We were concerned would have showers, but I think that they're going to be out in the Mississippi River Valley at about that time. So 430, then we'll roll it forward here and we'll get it closer to noon when we start to kind of wrap up things a bit. And there may be a few showers working their way into Rome or into Carrollton, but it'll be the afternoon when we see the more widespread showers move on in. We're not expecting to see a huge soaker, but we will see some showers on our Friday and that'll continue into Friday evening. But by Saturday, I think the first half of the weekend is going to be okay, mostly dry. There'll be some clouds out there, mostly cloudy skies on Saturday, but we'll have another break before our next system uh, gets worked up and we see things organized for rain on Sunday. So let's talk about Sunday. We start out with cloudy skies. This is the GFS model, the American model, and it shows that rain moving in during the afternoon and then into the evening as well. So by the time we get to Monday morning, it looks like we're gonna have a, a pretty wet Monday morning commute. And then into Tuesday as well, we'll end up seeing a pretty decent soaking rain. So this is exactly what we need. It's during the work week at the start of the work week. So at least we can get some much needed rainfall in and then colder air moving in behind that system. So we'll definitely be looking forward to getting a little bit of that rainfall. And luckily the weekend times out really nice nicely on this. In fact, on our Thursday, tomorrow, a 10 on the wasometer, looking really good with temperatures in the low 60s. For Friday, Canneth on Friday, we think most of the showers will move in after Canathon. Canathon, of course, early morning, bright and early at 430, and we'll have those clouds around, but I think we're going to be mostly dry for Canathon, most of the rain being later in the day. First half of the weekend, the best part of the weekend, we'll have mostly cloudy skies, but it'll be dry, and then we're starting to cool off as a front comes in on Sunday, and then into Monday and Tuesday, a 50% chance of rain. That'll be our better soaking rain once we get into the beginning of next week. There are claims the keto diet helps protect you from getting sick. Researchers are now looking into it with mice. Now, a group of researchers at Yale made one group of mice follow a keto diet, eating mostly foods that are high in fat and low in carbs. They fed the other group a lot of carbohydrates. Those mice were eating things that a lot of us eat. Both groups were given the flu virus, and the group of mice on the keto diet had a higher survival rate, but doctors say you shouldn't start throwing out all of your carb-heavy foods if you feel a cold coming on. It's a difficult diet, and there's just not enough out there to say, hey, you're not going to get the flu if you do the keto diet for three months. Doctors say instead of testing out diet trends to avoid the flu, get the vaccine, wash your hands, keep your hands away from your face, and remember, this is about of mice and men. <laughs> Thank you well, for the laugh. <laughs> I try, I try. I'm here for you. Well, between the Tigers and the Bulldogs, that game coming up this weekend, Saturday at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and thousands of fans are going to head out to cheer on both teams, especially the University of Georgia, the home team. But do you know why fans root for the dogs? Here's our why guy, Jerry Carnes, with a look at the association between the school and Bulldogs. How about them dogs? It's the battle cry of the red and black. Fans of the University of Georgia bark proudly when their athletic teams take to the field. Although the nickname surfaced a little more than 100 years ago, Georgia wasn't always known as the Bulldogs. Let's look at what led the University of Georgia to the doghouse. When Georgia's first football team took to the field in 1892, there was a goat on the sideline. 
a couple of years later, a female bull terrier that was the mascot of the Chi Phi fraternity began making appearances at games. Adding to that was the school's first president, Abraham Baldwin, who was a Yale bulldog. Early buildings on campus were designed following the blueprints of buildings at Yale. Some thought Georgia should adopt Yale's mascot as a tribute to Baldwin. According to UGA Sports Information Department, it was around 1910 when newspaper writers would occasionally refer to Georgia's teams as Bulldogs. But it wasn't until 1920 when one writer referred to the dignity and ferociousness of the Bulldog that the name stuck. Ugga the Bulldog attends games in an air-conditioned house located near the cheerleaders at Sanford Stadium. There have been 10 Uggas since 1956, all of them owned by the Seiler family of Savannah. Earlier this year, Sports Illustrated named Ugga the best mascot in all of college football. Sounds good to me. Jerry Card, <laughs> certainly a wealth of knowledge there. If you have a question for our Why Guy, you can send it on over on Facebook, Twitter, or by email. Coming up, Governor Kemp announces his pick to replace Senator Johnny Isaacson. What this could mean for Republicans in our state. And don't forget the 11 Alive Canathon, only a couple of days away. Each year we team up with the Salvation Army and we collect canned food to help Georgia families in need, and there are so many. You can help us on Friday. We would love the chance to see you out in person. We'll be at several various locations all over Metro Atlanta. Head on over to 11alive.com slash canathon for a list of those locations where you can join us. And if you can't make it out, our live coverage on 11 Alive begins at 4.30 in the morning. The worst kept secret in Georgia politics revealed today. Governor Kemp introducing Kelly Leffler as his pick for the U.S. Senate seat to replace the retiring Johnny Isaacson. Joining me right now is national columnist Ron Hart. And we want to talk about that Senate pick right now. A yeah. month ago, that might have been very surprising. But there yeah. has been a forward inertia on all of this where nobody was surprised today. Yeah, pushback against Trump, also some calculation on, on the part of the governor because women have kind of been fleeing a little bit the Republican Party in the suburbs, so a woman candidate would be good. Only the second woman senator from, from uh, Georgia in our history. The first one was in 1922, if you can believe that. Are you surprised that Governor Kemp would stand up to 
President Trump on this issue? I mean, he was very strong and stout uh, with yeah. Representative Collins. Well, good for him. If he likes the, if he likes Kelly, he should put her in there. I think he, uh, Trump is, uh, you know, he can bully people a little bit. I think uh, Kemp did himself well standing up to him. So it's his decision. He makes a decision. It's not patronage. It's not uh, a situation that Trump has much say in. How rowdy do you think 2020 is going to be when we get to the winter and the Democrats slugging it out in the snow of New Hampshire and Iowa? Yeah, 76 year old people walking through the snow. It could be dangerous <laughs> in New Hampshire. You know, they're, they're, they're this awkward age where they're too uh, they're, they're too too old for Snapchat. They're too young for visiting, visiting <laughs> angels. You know, so um, and life alerts. So they got these old people. That's what I like about the Leffler woman. She's 49. She could be there a long time. A subject Jordan. you and I like to talk about is student debt, student yeah. <laughs> loan, the value of college. Yeah. Some people should go to college, some people should not, but that's not acceptable in our culture. Sure. It's, a, it, you know, it's an article of faith that your kids should go to college, and too many people take on too much debt to send their kids to colleges that don't educate them very well. And the quality of the education, look, you know, I was a gender studies major in college back when there was only two of them. I, I'd have to go back right now and get re-educated. <laughs> I had a hot water heater that was replaced by a guy in July. And, and I was hanging around talking to him, and he said he will make six figures this year. And yeah. that the company that he worked for couldn't find enough talent, sure. enough help to be able to fill the holes that they had. People go to Georgetown, where I went for a while, and uh, basically pay 70000 bucks a year to study English, a language they already know. <laughs> Political science. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think maybe half the people should be in college. The cost has gone up a lot, twice the rate of inflation. It's priced itself out, out of the market as a value proposition. And a lot of families really need to sit down and think, is it worth taking on debt and send we, my kid to college? We're going to have to have a cultural change for that to happen. Sure. Well, right. we have to value hard work and, and, and gritty jobs. Right. We tend to, you know, you, you read Chaucer on your own time. I mean, you don't, you don't have to pay 40, <laughs> 50 grand a year to go do that. All right, let's talk about the SEC championship game here, LSU, Georgia. Ticket prices have gone down a little bit, surprisingly enough. You think it would be big, but it's not. Essentially a home game in many ways for uh, Georgia, but LSU fans tend to show up, and Did they're rowdy. Do you see the amount of money that Kirby Smart will collect if they win this game on Saturday? It, it's a king's ransom, man. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable how much money is out there for coaches of these great programs. Now. And if you look at studies like Saban, the money they spent for uh, Nick Saban in Alabama has paid off in tuition, increased enrollment. There is a mathematical right. calculus in it that works for the school. Ron Hart, thank you. Thousands petitioning to stop former Falcon Mike Vick from being honored at next year at a very special game with the NFL. What they are speaking out about. What's next?
Opening statements from the House Judiciary Committee began today as the impeachment inquiry into President Trump continues. And Georgia Congressman Doug Collins is playing a central role in defending the commander in chief. We have a, a, a just a deep seated hatred of a man who came to the White House and did what he said he was going to do. Well, Collins and fellow Republicans are focusing less now on possible charges and trying to put the process itself on trial. NBC's Alice Barr has more from today's hearings. From gathering facts to deciding what to do with them, the impeachment inquiry against President Trump is moving one step closer to action. We must move swiftly to do our duty. This is not an impeachment. This is just a simple railroad job. The House Judiciary Committee opening its first hearing with four constitutional scholars explaining high crimes and misdemeanors, three of them saying the president should be impeached for abusing his power in Ukraine. When President Trump invited, indeed demanded foreign involvement in our upcoming election, he struck at the very heart of what makes this a republic to which we pledge allegiance. That message is at the heart of this report. The Intelligence Committee concluding that President Trump used his office for political gain by urging Ukraine to announce investigations of the Biden's and 2016 election interference while withholding military aid. If what we're talking about is not impeachable, then nothing is impeachable. Democrats also making the case for obstruction, accusing the president of silencing witnesses and ignoring subpoenas. But the one law professor Republicans called argues this process is being rushed. Why you want to set the record for the fastest impeachment? And says Democrats haven't made their case. Close enough is not good enough. If you're going to accuse a president of bribery, you need to make it stick. This committee now weighing the evidence against the Constitution in deciding whether to impeach a president for the third time in American history. Smyrna has a new mayor tonight for the first time in more than 30 years. Derek Norton narrowly defeated Ryan Campbell with 51 percent of the vote. He will replace Max Bacon, who is retiring after three decades in Doraville. Joseph Greerman beat the incumbent Donna Pittman for the mayor's spot. He won with 65 percent of the vote. And in College Park, Bianca Motley Broom swept out the incumbent, Jack Longino. Broom won 75 percent of the vote. And it's still a nail-biter for the council seat four. In Morrow, Larry Ferguson and Ko Vu Yong each have exactly 300 votes. County election workers say that's still unofficial because there are likely mail-in and absentee ballots still to be counted. If it's still a tie after that, they will have another runoff. On December 31st, it gets awfully complicated. Well, your 11 Alive storm trackers were watching the temperatures rise today, and we actually made it all the way up to 60 degrees, so 11 degrees warmer than we were yesterday when we were in the 40s all day long. We ended up with a high of 49. So our gradual warm up will continue as we head into the next 48 hours or so. Showers will return on Friday, so we'll see a little cooler air moving in with that, and it'll be overcast and we'll have those showers off and on. It's a little cooler on Friday and into the weekend, but it does look like it'll be dry the first half of the weekend proper. So on Saturday will be mostly cloudy, but it looks like we will stay dry, which is great news for all of those fans in town for the LSU UGA SEC championship game. There will be quite a few clouds around for tailgaters, but will be dry with temperatures peaking in the upper 50s. So not bad upper 40s by the time you leave the game at eight o'clock. So coming up, we'll talk about the second half of the week and how that it could impact the Falcons fans heading to the game and when the really heavy rain could move in. Topping tonight's speed feed, investigators are releasing more information about three people killed inside a Conyers home. The Rockdale County Sheriff's Office released a statement today saying all three people killed were related and they believe their deaths were part of an isolated domestic dispute. Yesterday we learned that three people were killed when 50-year-old Michael Curry and 25-year-old Jida Curry and 19-year-old Joshua Baker. Fulton County Schools have released a statement saying Baker was a 2018 graduate of North Springs High. The school said their hearts are with his family and those who knew and loved him. Sports Illustrated is honoring Warwick Dunn, the former Falcon, former Tampa Bay Buccaneer, the FSU star. Dunn is the recipient of the Muhammad Ali Legacy Award for his incredible life, long-standing charitable work in the community. After his days in the NFL, he launched a, a home for the holidays. It provides fully furnished homes for single-parent families like Deshaun Watson helped uh, in his youth. 
by work done. His charity also supplies financial education, health, and wellness programs and scholarships to Atlanta residents. Work Done will receive the award Monday in New York City. He is an amazing man. Great update to a story we first told you about last week. Lifeline Animal Project waived adoption fees for Black Friday, and it paid off. Word got out. They set an all-time record for adoptions. But wonderful news, 472 pets found a forever home over the weekend. A wonderful way to start the holidays. A lot of wagging tails, a lot of happy hearts in humans and dogs. Mike Vick being honored by the NFL, the league announcing he will serve as a captain during the 2020 Pro Bowl. Now, thousands of activists are banding together online, calling on the NFL to strip the former Falcon quarterback of that honor. Two separate petitions are getting a whole lot of attention, some traction there online. Change.org has more than 140,000 signatures. AnimalVictory.org's petition has nearly 200,000. The Falcons dropped Vic back in 2009 while he was in prison on dogfighting charges. He was sentenced to nearly two years for running a dogfighting ring in Virginia. Both petitions claim honoring a man who had zero regard for animals is unacceptable. They say the NFL should do the right thing and strip Vic of all honors. Others, though, argue that Vic has served his time, paid his debt to society, and should be allowed to move on. The NFL has yet to respond to the petitions. Vic, along with three other NFL legends, including UJ standout Terrell Davis, will serve as captains during the game. The Pro Bowl is set for January 26th in Orlando. If you've ever been in an accident, you know that most insurance companies ask for a police report before they offer any kind of assistance. But what happens when the agency has been hacked so the report, it no longer exists? Well, it's part of a continuing fallout from the Georgia State Patrol ransomware attack. Joe Hankey talked to one driver, and she is struggling mightily trying to get some help. I had to go out and purchase a vehicle, you know, to get back and forth to work. The damage does not look bad on the surface, only a bent up rear bumper. But Willie Turner says a crash in July damaged her car's axle, totaling the used vehicle, and the crash also injured her hip and back. You know, when they hit me, they hit me so hard. You mean, I mean, they just, it knocked me forward. The car knocked the car forward. Turner says it happened on Interstate 20 westbound near Temple. After her car stalled in the right lane, Turner remembers calling 911 for help. A car stopped short of hitting hers, but then she says a MARTA police vehicle hit the van behind her, slamming it into her car. She blames the driver who hit the van, but is searching for answers of how to get a crash report so her insurance will let her file a claim. Right now, she is stuck with unanswered questions. What they mean, they no longer exist. This accident, this accident happened. Turner says at the scene, the only information she received was this piece of paper from the state trooper. It shows a report number, the trooper's name, and details of how drivers can usually request copies of reports, but no details of what happened. Turner's accident happened on July 25th. Today, a spokeswoman with the Georgia State Patrol told 11 Alive reports from July 23rd through part of July 26th no longer exist and were lost following a ransomware attack. Turner says she has called and went to GSP offices numerous times but got nowhere. A MARTA spokeswoman confirmed one of its police vehicles was involved in the crash, but they are still reviewing the case and have not been able to get a copy of the State Patrol crash report either. Turner says she tried hiring an attorney to represent her, but they wouldn't take her case without a report. On file. Giving or receiving, we've got what you need to know about shipping packages this holiday season. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe, join the conversation in the community section. We have more 11 Alive news in prime time right after the break.
With record-breaking sales on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, the demand for online, on-time delivery is at an all-time high. You better get there on time is what the translation is. And not only will there be more packages to deliver this year, but the holiday shopping season it is ticking. I confess I'm one of them. So on top <laughs> of finding those gifts faster, you're also facing a time crunch to actually get them to the right place when you want it to get there. NBC's Vicki Nguyen has all we need to know about shipping, including how to protect your packages. With only three weeks until Christmas, the clock is ticking to get those gifts on time. This holiday season, companies are expected to deliver more than 2 billion packages. So what are the shipping deadlines to get your gifts to arrive on time? For standard shipping, the last day you can ship is December 13th for UPS, the 14th for the Postal Service, and the 16th for FedEx. For two-day shipping, UPS and FedEx will need your boxes by the 20th. For priority shipping, the Postal Service cutoff is the 21st. And for overnight shipping, the deadline for all three is December 23rd. That date also applies to Amazon orders for Prime members. But getting those deliveries to your front door is only half the battle. Watch out for thieves who are working overtime this holiday. Porch pirates across the country caught on camera, like this guy making a getaway just days ago with three packages at once. This woman, too, jetting off with a stolen box. So what can you do to protect your purchase? Set delivery alerts for every package you ship. That way you get an email or a text right to your phone letting you know when the package ships and when it arrives. You can also select signature required on the shipping label so your package isn't left on an empty porch. Another possibility, have your packages shipped to your office. That way you can be sure someone is always on the receiving end. Or you can have it delivered to a trusted neighbor. And get the extra insurance, especially if you have an expensive package. It's only a few dollars more and it can really save you if your package is lost or damaged. For example, if you're shipping through FedEx and your package is worth $300, you can insure the entire amount for just $2. And one more thing to note, the number of boxes coming your way for the holidays. If you have the choice and the time, opt to get your items delivered in as few packages as possible. That way there's less waste and less for you to track. Whether you're shipping across town or across the country, simple tips to get those packages home in time for the holidays. A couple other things for you to consider. Think about installing a home security camera or video doorbell so you can see when those packages arrive in real time. It's a proliferation of porch pirates. We never even oh, yeah. heard this term three to five years ago. Mm -hmm. Now it seems like they're in every neighborhood. Yeah. A lot of carriers offer lockers or drop boxes where you can have your packages delivered too, which seems like a pretty good idea. Sometimes stores like Walgreens and Michaels also accept deliveries even if you didn't make your purchase there or have your package delivered to your place of employment. We do that here. Yeah, Friday. and finally, try to avoid shipping very expensive items or cash. If you're sending a gift card, think about doing it electronically or make sure that you get a signature. A nice fair weather pattern today. Just a few high clouds wifting by from time to time. And we're looking at high pressure as our main weather feature here. So it's quiet for now, but we're watching a system brewing in the southwest. It's going to take a bit of time to get here. I think by Friday, we'll start to see the results of this area of low pressure with its associated fronts moving from the southwest over us. So that gives us about a 30% chance of rain on our Friday. And then there's some cooler air behind it that we can expect expect to move in once we get into the weekend and next week. So enjoy the sunshine on your Thursday. This is early on Thursday, right around 9 a.m. in the morning. High pressure still in control as it moves to the east. As we get into Thursday night and Friday, the clouds start to move in. So this is 430 in the morning. And the reason I chose that time to stop this animation is because we have Canathon at that time. And we did think we were going to have rain, but it looks like right now we'll just have cloudy skies with the rain still off into Mississippi. So it'll take a while for it to get here. But right around lunchtime, we'll start to see some of that rain moving in to northwest Georgia with the heavier stuff here still back across Alabama and Mississippi. And that storm system will be on approach with more widespread rain by the afternoon hour. So let's talk about that timing early on our Friday. So the clouds are around starting at 430. We'll have our broadcast out there. Chesley McNeil 
will be live at Canathon and uh, we'll see the clouds continue to roll on in here throughout the day and then the showers beginning to move in during the early afternoon. So this is 1230 taking you into 330 and you can see maybe some decent downpours heading in towards Carrollton and those moving across during the evening commute on our Friday. So any Friday night football games that are happening, it looks like uh, there may be some showers around still for those uh, during the evening. So for your weekend, we dry it out on Saturday, a nice dry start to the day, and then we end up seeing that 30% chance of rain on our Sunday. So for your seven day outlook, we're expecting to see a nice day on our Thursday, lots of sunshine, a 10 on the wasometer. On Friday, a six on the wasometer, it's underneath the can here for Canathon, 40% chance of rain, mainly in the afternoon and evening. We dry it out for Saturday, a nice start to the weekend, and then the rain returns on Sunday, and it does look like a fairly wet start to next week. This is a morphine pill, what this is. All of this is medicine. Oh, are you I'm George? George? I'm George. Nice to meet you. I'm a hugger. Can I give you a hug? Yeah, sure. I need a hug all the time. Right? Want to kiss each other or yeah. kiss on the cheek? Or, yeah. 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 <laughs> if you've been through it, you know that as soon as you lose someone, one of the first things you turn to are photographs. Grief, loss, and heartbreak all hit each of us at some point. This is quite a story. Matt Pearl learned of a nonprofit that provides a powerful way to cope and a couple in need of, of so much. Here is this week's Untold Atlanta. Okay. 
George Hudson. Videos and photos. Cooking these famous college wings. Pixels and pages make moments immortal. We got there with help and help. Yep. Four days before Thanksgiving, George Hudson runs the kitchen. Four days later, I'm the cooker man. <laughs> he's at it again. Yeah. This time, it's cookies. I got a red velvet cookie. I got a key lime cooker. This time, <laughs> George and his wife Latasha. She's actually the baker. I'm just a good helper. Are hours just away from a free family photo shoot. Something that I'll always remember. A shoot that wouldn't happen. Yeah, I'll be okay. If George. <laughs> wasn't extremely sick. Yeah, that's what it was. I got too hyped. This is a morphine pill. George has lung disease. What this is? Prostate cancer. Uh, and stage four colon cancer. All of this is medicine. He was given one year to live six years ago. Well over a hundred uh, chemo sessions. Every now and then, uh, my eyes will get a little, but I like fight them back, get back, you know. Because <laughs> you know, I don't want it to be that way, but these are tears of joy. You know, I mean, everything that's going on to me is positive right now, today. Uh, but today's shoot also wouldn't happen without Skylar. It was right before her first surgery. That was one of my favorites, just those big blue eyes. Ashley Jones gave birth to Skylar 10 years ago. It's just a wonderful session. Two months in. It's really similar to ALS. She learned her daughter had spinal muscular atrophy. Yeah, when they gave us the diagnosis, they told us it was a premature expiration. Um, and that she'd be lucky to see her first birthday. In the time they had... I would tickle her face with my hair. Photos and photo shoots became treasures and treasured times. In this shoot, uh, she was around 16 months old, and then she died at 21 months old. On what would have been Skylar's sixth birthday, Ashley launched Love Not Lost. Her team shoots free portraits for children and adults with terminal diseases. Oh, it's just a photo shoot, or it's just pictures. But if you've been through it, you know that as soon as you lose someone, one of the first things you turn to are photographs. It's a way that keeps that memory close. All I gotta do is just stay alive. It's also a way. I'm gonna ride it till the wheels fall off. To face unstoppable tragedy yeah. and seize control. Hi, how are you? Are you I George? Good. I'm George. So here it goes. I'm a hugger. Can I give you a hug? Yeah, sure. I need hugs all the time. 90 minutes. One, two, three. Okay. Hundreds of photos. So she said, would you marry me? I said, oh, I'm so flattered, of course. <laughs> and true to form. Jesus, make me laugh. An overflow. Do you want to kiss each other or yeah. kiss on the cheek or, yeah. Mm. Of laughs. Yeah. <laughs> I was finna tongue you, but I thought I'm not doing it. <laughs> this is how pain becomes power. And when I tell you to, you're just gonna go in for that big old group hug. <laughs> a final photo. Look at those cookies. A fitting gift. George, like, thank you so much. And soon. We'll be thinking about you guys and Please, hope you have I need a wonderful holiday. Pixels and photos. Can y'all yeah. pray for me? I need to pray. That will add to the moments. Peace out, love. Tell him God what he can do. He that make one man immortal. My wife is there. Got me feeling really good. Thank yeah. you. Love you. For Untold Atlanta. So we all good. I'm Matt Pearl. Y'all have a good Sunday. Stay blessed.
Well, let the Cola Wars begin. Here we can, and, and we do so anew after being shut out of last year's Super Bowl in its hometown. Coca-Cola is making a return for Super Bowl 54. Yeah, according to Variety, Coca-Cola bought 60 seconds of airtime during the big game on February 2nd. So how much would that cost? Well, if Fox executive said it was seeking more than $5 million for just a 30-second ad, so you do the math on that one. Wow. Last year in our own hometown, Coca-Cola ended its 11-year run of Super Bowl appearances thanks to an advertising blitz from Pepsi. So, which kicked off the unofficial Cola Wars? Here we go. It's more than a skirmish. Pepsi was the official sponsor of Super Bowl 53 in Atlanta, but Coca-Cola had the pouring rights inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium. The two made slight digs at each other, both in local advertising and on social media. Coca-Cola has a memorable history of Super Bowl ads, one featuring Pittsburgh Steeler player Mean Joe Green, and who can forget those lovable animated polar bears? And Fox executives say it's already sold out all of its commercial inventory for the game. Inventory is still up for grabs pre and post game, but that will cost around $3 million. I know That's everybody loves to talk about the commercials, but we're starting to see them earlier and earlier. Oh, uh, we are. And so it's kind of like, what's the point? Ron, Aisha, what do you think? You I know, mean, I love it. I, I think it's, it's outstanding. The one I remember is Michael Jackson in that Pepsi commercial. Remember mm. that back in the day? Well, I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not I, sure. I, I, I know that, Ron, you and I were big RC Cola drinkers. Yeah, that's true. RC yeah. Cola? I didn't yeah. know that. Think about that. Uh -huh. you guys, All I'm you gonna guys. say is I'm glad to see the fight is back. You can't come to my hometown and shut us out of commercials, so I'm glad to see Coke flexing their muscles on that Absolutely. one. Absolutely, you're right. It is a good one, guys. Well, hey, it is almost 9 o'clock, and we have a lot coming up next on 11 Alive News Primetime. Yeah, that's right, folks. A dangerous day on Atlanta roadways after a police chase turns deadly. Then a deadly shooting shuts down parts of interstates 1 or 285 and also 20. Plus, how those posts about your kids could haunt them later. But is it enough to get you to stop doing it? 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. All right, folks, we're all right, folks, we're going to begin tonight with two major traffic accidents, incidents in Atlanta's west side, just hours apart from each other. Three people died in both incidents here. 11 Alive's Elwin Lopez is following both of the stories for us tonight live from Atlanta Police Headquarters. Elwin. Yeah, Ron Aisha, Atlanta Police say that a man was in his car when he was shot in the chest on I-285 southbound and I-20 eastbound. Officers say that the alleged shooter was in a separate vehicle and he is believed to have called police around 4 p.m. and remained in the car on the scene until they arrived. At this point, police tell us they don't know what led up to that shooting. And now we're not able to confirm whether you know or not that it was in fact a road rage incident, but of course it is a possibility. And just 10 miles away, two hours apart near the west side wall, officers say two innocent people were killed when an armed carjacking led to a police chase. A horrific scene captured by a viewer here after the crash happened. Police tell me the two victims were killed when the two 19-year-old carjacking suspects crashed into their car during the pursuit. Officers say that happened when they ran a red light at Campbellton Road and Lee Street. Well, this was a pursuit. I mean, it does fall within our uh, standard operating procedure. We don't chase everyone. We're very strict on who we allow our officers to chase. In this case, since the vehicle was taken by gunpoint, it was a carjacking. We did allow the chase to continue. And the suspects in both cases are currently in police custody and are expected to face charges. Ron? Elwin, thanks a lot for the update there. By the way, folks, another deadly crash, this one in Gwinnett County involving a school bus. Police say the driver in the other car was killed. Video from 11 Alive Sky Tracker shows a lot of front end damage to that bus. This is taking place near Puckett's Mill Road in Hamilton Mill. And uh, we're also being told that it was carrying special education students from Ivy Creek Elementary School. None of the kids on the bus, they were hurt. However, the driver, the driver and the monitor, they were injured, but they should be okay. Police are looking into whether the other driver was suffering from some sort of medical emergency. Investigators are releasing more information about three people killed inside a Conyers home. The Rockdale County Sheriff's Office released a statement today saying all three people killed were related and they believe their deaths were part of an isolated domestic dispute. 
Yesterday, we learned the three people killed were 50-year-old Michael Curry, 25-year-old Jada Curry, and 19-year-old Joshua Baker. Fulton County Schools also released a statement saying Baker was a 2018 graduate of North Springs High. The school said their hearts are with his family and those who knew and loved him. Our John Sherrick is working on this story for Up Late at 11 over on our sister station, 11 Alive. I'm a lifelong conservative, pro-Second Amendment, pro-Trump, pro-military, and pro-wall. I mean, now is a great opportunity to really seek the truth and the facts and learn about the real Kelly Leffler. Today, Governor Brian Kemp made it official. Kelly Leffler will be Georgia's next U.S. Senator. Leffler is the CEO of the Atlanta Dream. She didn't waste any time answering critics and pushback from some conservatives. And uh, she's taking Johnny Isaacson's seat as he steps down later on this month. 11 Alive's Doug Richards was at the state capitol as the governor revealed his not-so-secret pick. So here's what folks are going to find out about me. I'm a lifelong conservative, pro-Second Amendment, pro-Trump, pro-military, and pro-wall. I make <laughs> The room at the Capitol, overcrowded with invited guests, liked what they heard from Kelly Loeffler, Georgia's newly anointed Republican star politician. And she sought to stifle critics who had clamored for Governor Kemp to instead appoint Congressman Doug Collins, a vocal defender of President Trump, to the seat instead. I am angered by the impeachment circus. Make no mistake, Washington Democrats want to overturn much more than an election. They want to overturn our way of life because they resent America's success. Leffler could still face a challenge from Collins in next year's special election. But Leffler's husband, Jeff Sprecher, is reportedly worth a half billion dollars and owns the New York Stock Exchange, raising her funding capability and the expectations of her backers. That puts the onus on her to do it well. You know, if she falls on her face out the door and there's a legitimate challenger, this thing's over before it starts. Wow. But she has the opportunity to go out there and kill it. I make no apologies for my conservative values. And if she does well, she could stoke Republican hopes for Senator David Perdue's re-election and President Trump's chances to carry Georgia next fall. I think the only way for us to win in 2020 and beyond is for us to rally together. That's the only way Kelly will get elected. It's the only way Senator Perdue will get elected and President Trump will get elected is if Republicans are unified. Governor Kemp made a point to say he's proud to appoint the first woman from Georgia to serve in the U.S. Senate in nearly 100 years. The only other female senator from our state served for one day. Rebecca Latimer Felton served a single day, November 21st, 1922. She was the first woman to ever serve in the U.S. Senate, appointed after a man's death. There have been 56 female senators since 1789, 36 Democrats, 20 Republicans. 17 were appointed, seven of them to succeed husbands who had died. Kelly Leffler now joins 25 other female senators in Congress, the first time in history one-fourth of the members are women. Henry Woodfin Grady's name is hard to avoid in Atlanta, Grady Hospital, Grady High School. But Georgia State University students want a statue of him in Atlanta taken down. They say Grady was a racist. Grady was an editor of the Atlanta Constitution and namesake of the University of Georgia's School of Journalism. He's quoted in several speeches from the 1880s talking about the supremacy of the white race. There is an issue with removing the statue, though, because of a new law here in Georgia. Governor Brian Kemp just signed it in April. The law says my Monuments can't be moved, so the students are asking for a compromise here. They want a plaque added to the statue that will clarify who Grady was and what he believed. The city has done that before with other Confederate markers, so there is precedent here. We will follow this story up and see what happens from here. Our well, 11 Alive storm trackers were tracking those temperatures today, and we ended up seeing a cool start down in the mid 30s. So, a little chill in the air this morning, but by the afternoon and early evening, we were up to 60 degrees. So, we were running well above where we were yesterday. So, our high temperatures all across North Georgia, it was pretty mild. Athens 62, Rome 62, 63 in Peachtree City, and in Thomaston. So, a nice mild afternoon. And those temperatures right now, compared to 24 hours 
ago. We're running 10 degrees warmer than we were at this time yesterday. So we will be a little warmer to start tomorrow. So the next 12 hours, those skies will be mostly clear and the winds have weakened quite a bit. So our temperatures will be dropping down into the upper 30s overnight and then a nice sunny start to our Thursday. So a 10 on the wisometer on that scale of 1 to an 11 with 11 being perfect, a 10. So starting out around 37, getting up to 62. So it looks like that gradual warm up will continue. We'll see those showers moving back in on Friday and it looks like a little later timing. We originally thought that this could douse Canathon a bit, but now it looks like they're going to be a little bit later in the day and then it looks like it'll be dry the first half of the weekend with more rain on the way and we'll have the timing of all that precip coming up. All right, Sam, see you in a couple of minutes. A warning from a local couple after a nightmare experience in Mexico. Steven Johnson got sick, and a private hospital would not let him go until he paid his $16,000 bill. No credit card, no payment plans allowed there. He says he'd still be there if not for Tyler Perry. Caitlin Ross is the first reporter to talk to the couple now that Steven is out of the hospital here in Atlanta. They say it was scary to be in a foreign country not knowing the language and having no idea when they could get home. Steven had no pre-existing conditions when he left for the trip, but the day he landed, he got extremely sick. He was diagnosed with diabetes at a private Mexican hospital, and his treatment added up to $16,000. He was uninsured when he left, but his fiance says even with American insurance, travelers still have to pay for the balance up front, then get reimbursed. She says she had no idea what they were getting into and suggests everyone buy international traveler's insurance that could be as cheap as seven bucks a trip. That's when it really hit me that, okay, they, these people are really serious. We didn't know that foreign countries, you got to pay the bill up front. Try to be like, hey, can we pay half and do a payment plan? You know, what financial proof do you need? How do we set this up for a payment plan? And she was just like, absolutely not. You pay it all now or you don't leave. Steven's fiance posted on Facebook looking for help. Incredibly, Tyler Perry saw it and helped them out so Steven could return to the U.S. He says getting traveler's insurance is critical. He also suggests taking a list of emergency contact numbers and information about the local American embassy, which can help in a jam. They say they are eternally grateful to Perry and they'll never travel without insurance again. A new report raising some eyebrows nationwide. It's linking popular hair products that many of us women use to cancer. We'll tell you all about it coming up next. And don't forget, folks, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. is raising concerns about permanent hair dyes and chemical straighteners used by millions of women. It found a possible link between those products and an increased risk for breast cancer. Sarah Deloff reports. From Hollywood to home salons, a third of American women color or straighten their hair. 
Now a new study is raising concerns about a possible link between permanent hair dyes, chemical straighteners, and an increased risk of breast cancer. Women who reported using permanent hair dye or chemical straighteners had a higher risk of developing breast cancer over an eight-year follow-up period. The study, published in the International Journal of Cancer, looked at more than 46,000 women who were cancer-free themselves but had a sister with the disease. It found white women who used permanent hair dye had a 7% increased breast cancer risk. Black women had a 45 percent increased risk. One of our hypotheses is that the products marketed to dye black women's hair might be different than the products that are used for white women's hair. Women who used chemical straighteners had an 18 percent increased risk that jumped to 31 percent when the product was used every five to eight weeks. For now, the study's authors aren't advising women to stop using the products. We know that a lot of different factors influence a woman's risk of developing breast cancer, um, including their um, weight and their diet and their physical activity. And so this is another factor that we need to consider. But health experts do advise women to wear gloves during application, leave product on only as long as necessary, and rinse hair thoroughly, minimizing exposure as they work to better understand the risk. Experts also suggest women consider switching to a semi-permanent dye if possible. Well, your 11 Alive storm trackers watching those high cirrus clouds moving through today. Another great sunset. Wasn't quite as colorful as last night, but looked pretty nice. And it definitely felt nice outside because temperatures were some 11 degrees warmer today. So David Wentworth here in Cherokee County capturing this beautiful shot. He's one of our 11 Alive storm trackers on our 11 Alive Storm Tracker Facebook page. And looking out over Blue Ridge right now, you can see those Christmas lights adorning the Santa Express. I've always wanted to do that. I have never gone up and done that train ride, but a lot of folks are. And what, what a great evening to be out looking at lights here in Atlanta as well, with the temperatures as mild as they have been. 60 degrees for a high temperature today, after morning low of 35. So we did start it out pretty chilly, but we definitely overperformed. We made it up three degrees above average today. We should be around 57 for a high temperature. Rainfall, we really need it. We are seven and, and three quarters of an inch behind for the year. So we're still dealing with drought conditions and it looks like we'll end up seeing rain coming at us on Friday, but even more as we head into Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. So temperatures looking like this right now all across North Georgia, 44 in Clayton, 35 in Blairsville. They've definitely dropped there already. 41 in Dalton, 45 in Marietta. 41 in Carrollton and 43 in Peachtree City. So a nice mild night, high pressures in control. Things are very quiet and we have to look uh, kind of far off to the west to see the next system that's coming here. And it's really just taking shape over Arizona, really over the Four Corners region. This whole low is going to be shifting in our direction, moving to the east. So by Friday, that'll return showers here to the Atlanta area. So we are going to be warming up a little bit more as we head into tomorrow. The morning lows won't be as cool and the afternoon temperatures will be a little warmer as well. Showers move in during the day on Friday. We think pretty much after Canathon and then rain returns Sunday and then really picks up in its intensity Monday and Tuesday. So a high pressure in place for now. We have plenty of sunshine for Thursday. Clouds roll in Friday morning. This is 430 in the morning. That's right about the time. Chelsea McNeil will be out there with the rest of uh, the crew bringing you all the details with the Canathon with the Salvation Army. And then we'll see the showers moving in most likely afternoon. This is right at straight up noon. And then during the afternoon, notice how more showers move in here. So we'll be watching for that possibility Friday afternoon. So the timing on that looks like this. We have a few clouds out there to start on Friday. Friday, but I think we'll be okay for Canathon. And then you can see these showers moving in, the heavier stuff here from Carrollton down into Peachtree City. And then we get a nice break day on our Saturday. Of course, we have so much going on. The SEC Championship is going to be here on Saturday with all of the fans. Falcon game on Sunday where we have a 30% chance for rain. And then those rain chances will be going up as we head into the beginning of next week. So a nice Thursday, showers on Canathon. Saturday starts out pretty darn nice. And then we'll see the rain return on Sunday. Well, we need the rain. All right, thanks a lot, Sam. An East Atlanta music teacher embodies pop culture quotes with her artwork. Lexicon of Love is the brainchild of a local music teacher and mixed media artist, Lexa Bancroft.
Since 2014, Bancroft has been creating custom vintage paintings utilizing little more than recycled sheet music, paint, markers, and love. What started out as a cathartic form of expression and conversation turned into a vibrant business. Very, very first piece I ever painted and wrote on, it said, I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free. And I, I just needed that kind of stuff in my life at that point. I was, you know, early 20s, trying to figure things out, out of college, and it was trying to, like, figure out what my path would be. Mixed media is, is just super free, and there's just no rules where anything has to be in that background. Um, you, you can just make it wherever you are on that day and just make that happen. So Bancroft has already received an Amber Grant for Women Entrepreneurs. All right, folks, you know what time it is. You see your screen. It is time for Wednesday's edition of the AC, and we are kicking off with the debut of the highly anticipated Georgia-filmed Black Widow. Mm -hmm. It's a Marvel movie, and everyone's talking about it. The trailer, which is the first film in Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, just dropped. I mean, wow. Scarlett Johansson reprises her role as Natasha, or Black Widow. She meets up with her sis, Yelena, played by Florence Pugh, and the rest of her assassin family, including David Harbour, you know, his Red Guardian, and Rachel Wise's character, Melina. Together, the family goes back to where it all started, to take down whatever evil threat lurks in the distance. And keep in mind, actor David Harbour, who was also star in uh, Stranger Things, was in Georgia back in September filming both of these projects. We showed you the photo then. Black Widow comes out. May 2020. Okay, now I have a, a huge announcement. We are having a baby shower. Well, I'm not, but the cast of Doom Patrol is filming a baby shower scene, and you can be in it, so catch this casting. This is for season two, and filming goes down on Monday, December 9th in Conyers. Casting directors are looking for five women of all ethnicities, ages 28 to 38, to portray besties of the mother-to-be. So if you've already booked with, you know, the Doom Patrol series, they don't want you to submit, but you can only submit if you have a car that is not red, white, or black. And for more of the A-Scene folks, head on over to our website to see what's filming in your neck of the woods, 11alive.com slash the A-Scene. All right, so parents post pictures of their children all the time, and in many cases, your kids are not okay with it. Next, why you should stop sharing tink so much. <laughs> And in your week, making a difference. A reminder, the 11 Alive Canathon is on Friday. We're going to be out there collecting canned goods to help families in need. Help us stock the food banks. That's right, and we're going to have teams all across the metro on Friday. And we'd love to see you there. We have a list of all the locations on 11alive.com.
So if you spend any time on social media, it is a safe bet you regularly see posts from parents sharing proud moments and pictures of their kids. But there is the reason for the term sharenting. All the information you may be sharing could be a problem in the future. Cheryl Preheim, Caitlin Ross, and I wanted to hear what you had to say about it in our series on YouTube, Alive at Five. A new study says the average five-year-old has 1,500 pictures of them online. Another found that 90% of kids have an online presence by the time they're five years old. It's called sharenting, and some experts say it can cause real damage to your child, including costing them jobs and identity theft. But when told this information, some parents still say they're going to post whatever they want. Might just be more thoughtful, even more intentional now in, in what I post. When you go to Target and give them your social security number to get that red card, you're taking a chance. For me, the good is going to outweigh the bad. Interesting. Now listen, oh. last night, I took a video of my daughter. I thought it was so sweet. She did a little newscast to surprise me when I came home. And after I stopped recording, she said, you're not going to post that, are you? And I thought, oh. do you want me to? And I said, I'll only post it if you want me to. I think there's a certain age where it should be the child's decision mm -hmm. whether they're online or not. Yeah, She's you know, 10. She's 10. Most times I see the kids get sick of it at a certain age with the parents who go over the top. Yeah. Cheryl, mm -hmm. I don't think you do it that much, but for the parents who post their kids every day, by the time they hit like five or six, they're doing this to the camera. Right. Like, stop they don't want it. warning yeah. me. It's right. too much. But I'm the lady with no kids who eats it up. <laughs> I love to see it. <laughs> and I think some people get sucked in to post things that are right on the edge because they think it's going to give them likes and yeah. it's to the detriment of a child right. because it might be embarrassing or put them in a compromising position. Do you want your child to find, have someone find that video of them 10 years later? You guys had a lot to say about this one. Tanya, she is all about it and she says, as long as I'm taking care of their needs, I'm going to post whenever I want to, probably Ooh. even after <laughs> too. You're my property. Essentially, I'm going to post you, Tanya said. Well, Sean Murphy says, listen, my daughter's She's beautiful, take photos every chance I can. She is embarrassed of them now. See, they don't want it. You live one time, memories may embrace it, embarrass them, love every second. Hmm. But meanwhile, the kids are like, please stop, right. right? Nicole says, I no longer post photos of my kids publicly. I have a private Instagram account. Small human beings who will be adults one day, not toys, not property. And on the serious side of it, it can lead to vast amounts of identity theft for yes. these kids in the future because their digital footprint is out there and it's really not by their own posting. We found some parents. research about that, Aisha. By 2030, sharenting could account for up to 7 million incidents of identity theft and $800 million in online fraud. So it is beyond just the issue of is it embarrassing or not. Right, and how bad would you feel if you were a parent and caused that to happen to your kid? Exactly. But I posted a Twitter poll, asked people, if you're a parent, do you post your kid? 100% of them said yes. Yeah. Oh, so. All right, well, I'm going to go like those pictures. <laughs> I like mine too. <laughs> well, we want to hear from you. You can leave your thoughts in the comment section on the video on the 11 Alive YouTube page. Up next. Oh my God, this is my girlfriend, buddy. I didn't ask for this. And it changed my life. The case of a fatal accident and a big missed opportunity. Headed HN, no indicators whatsoever. A reveal investigation coming up on Prime Time on WATL.
Michael Vick is now being honored by the NFL. The league announcing that he will serve as a captain during the 2020 Pro Bowl. Now thousands of activists are banding together online, calling on the NFL to strip the former Falcons quarterback of, of that honor. Two separate petitions are getting a lot of attention online. Change.org has more than 140,000 signatures. AnimalVictory.org's petition has nearly 200,000 signatures. The Falcons dropped Vic back in 2009 while he was in prison on dogfighting charges. He was sentenced to nearly two years for running a dogfighting ring in Virginia. Both petitions claim honoring a man who had zero regard for animals is unacceptable. And they said the NFL should do the right thing and strip Vic of all the honors. Others argue that Vic served his time, paid his debt to society, and should be allowed to move on. The NFL has not yet responded to those petitions. Vic, along with three other NFL legends, including UGA standout Terrell Davis, will serve as captains during the game. The Pro Bowl is scheduled for January 26th in Orlando. And it looks like we're going to have some pretty good uh, football weather this weekend here as we approach the SEC championship. Uh, and it's going to be perfectly timed in between some rain that's going to come in on Friday and rain on our Sunday. So high temperatures today, 55 in Blairsville, 58 in Gainesville, 60 in Atlanta. We rebounded up from the 40s where we were yesterday. So even right now at this time of night, we're 10 degrees warmer in Atlanta and Carrollton. And check that out in Rome, almost 20 degrees warmer in Rome. So I think that bodes well for us on our Thursday that we're going to see some mild temperatures and comfortable conditions. So overnight tonight, we're going to see mostly clear skies. Those temperatures won't be quite as chilly as they were this morning, but I think we'll get down into the upper 30s, seeing plenty of sunshine for our Thursday. It's just going to be a great, mild winter day. So we have a 10 on our resometer on that scale of 1 to an 11, with an 11 being a perfect day, a 10, which is pretty good, starting out in the upper 30s and getting into the low 60s. And then we'll start to see some changes as we head into the weekend. We'll have showers returning on Friday, a dry first half of the weekend, but the second half of the weekend is looking a little bit soggy, especially into the beginning of next week, Sunday night into Tuesday. So we'll have more details on that coming up in just a minute. All right, thanks, Sam. Topping tonight's speed feed. Better pay those who work for you to protect the community. That is what DeKalb County leaders plan to talk about tomorrow. At stake, raises for about 2,300 employees. That includes police officers, sheriffs, deputies, firefighters, and dozens of other emergency workers. DeKalb CEO Michael Thurman won't talk about how much of a raise, but promises the plan that he has is significant with those salary increases for the 2020 fiscal year. Pay for public safety employees is an issue in several metro communities, and they're looking at especially cities struggling to fill those open positions. A battle over compensation for Cobb County first responders resulted in a 7% pay raise for next year. Former President Jimmy Carter is out of the hospital and back home tonight. He was admitted to the Phoebe Sumter Medical Center in Americas over the weekend for a UTI. That was just days after he was released from Emory Hospital after undergoing a successful surgery to relieve a brain bleed. In a, a statement, President Carter says he's looking forward to recovering at home and that he and former First Lady Rosalind wish everyone peace and joy this holiday season. They're not anything that presents an impeachment here, except a president carrying out his job in the way the Constitution saw that he sees fit to do it. A fiery defense for President Donald Trump from Georgia Representative Doug Collins today as the ongoing impeachment inquiry entered a new phase. The House Judiciary Committee holding its first public hearings today. Four witnesses giving their expert opinions on the Constitution and its provisions for impeachment. Experts from the law schools of Harvard, Stanford, George Washington University, and the University of North Carolina weighing in on that today. One saying the founders would be horrified. Jennifer Bellamy walks us through the big takeaway takeaways from today. Another day, another impeachment proceeding on Capitol Hill. The testimony from constitutional scholars wasn't unanimous, but not for the reason you might think. Nearly all of the witnesses, three law school professors, agree that there is enough evidence to impeach President Trump from last month's Intelligence Committee hearings. They say it shows the president did commit high crimes and misdemeanors. A president should resist foreign interference in our elections, not demand it, and not welcome it. After reviewing the evidence that's been made public, I cannot help but conclude that this president has attacked each of the Constitution's safeguards against establishing a monarchy in this country. 
Only one professor argued that in this case, impeachment is wrong. But that opinion wasn't based on what President Trump did or did not do. It was due to the fact that the case is not complete, and he felt the process was being rushed. It's wrong because this is not how you impeach an American president. This case is not a case of the unknowable. It's a case of the peripheral. We have a record of conflicts, defenses that have not been fully considered, unsubpoenaed witness with material evidence. To impeach a president on this record would expose every future president to the same type of inchoate impeachment. The White House refused an invitation for the president and his attorneys to take part in the day's proceedings. The hearings unfolding while President Trump was out of the country, participating in the NATO summit in London. They have not ruled out participating in the future. So if the Judiciary Committee decides the president's actions constitute high crimes and misdemeanors, it will then draw up articles of impeachment. That will then trigger a full vote by the members of the House. Here at 11 Alive, we're going to continue following the stories that impact you in the months leading up to the presidential election. You'll find those updates and all the big national, state, and local political issues on our 11 Alive app. A North Georgia woman spent several terrifying minutes on the phone with 911 trying to stop a driver who was repeatedly swerving into oncoming traffic. But that's just the beginning of this story in remote Towns County near the North Carolina border. We obtained recordings showing three chances a single sheriff's deputy had to prevent a fatal crash. Oh my God, you want to kill somebody. Oh God, he just got run somebody else off the road. Helpless. I was scared. Please, oh God, they got the hurry. He's still all over the road. Oh my God, yes, he's in the other lane, cars coming. I knew something was going to happen. I just knew that was his last turn. <gasps> It ended worse than I thought. How bad? <sighs> bad enough to see things that you only see on horror movies. Oh, God. Oh, God, he's dead. He's dead. The call spanned nearly nine minutes, two miles in Towns County, Georgia, three miles into North Carolina, before it ended with a head-on crash. I don't think there's anything left of him. Terry Silvers, the suspected impaired driver, crossed the center line and was killed instantly. A combined 100 mile per hour impact with the car driven by grandmother Tracy Stewart. Why me? Because me and my granddaughter was riding down the road. We were talking, we were having a good time, and I didn't ask for this. And it changed my life. After four surgeries, Stewart has a six inch plate in her dominant arm, a pin in her foot, and internal injuries. I'll have to deal with this the rest of my life. But she's still haunted by that 911 call. Where are they at? Every word, every second that ticks by is a second closer to an impact with you and your granddaughter. It was very damaging for me to hear that call. That is uh, Terry Silvers. <laughs> and when she told him it was Terry Silvers, it should have took all seriousness to their head. Because they knew. Because yeah. they know Terry Silvers. Terry Silvers. Yep, it's him. This is police body camera footage from last November. Could have hurt yourself and killed somebody else. When Terry Silvers totaled his pickup truck in a one vehicle rollover. Can, can, uh, can he tow my house to right over here? Any signs? Of him impaired? Yeah. Not that I can tell. This lady right here, she feels quite sure he's under the influence of drugs. Oh, he's so screwed up. He'll pass out. Deputy Greg Joseph checked his eyes using horizontal gaze nystagmus or HGN. Had it HGN, no indicators whatsoever. There's no indicators in his eyes at all that he's under the influence of anything. But certain drugs can be that way. I mean, I know because I'm more dispatched. And let him, and While alcohol and some drugs cause a detectable eye stutter called nystagmus, opioids and stimulants do not. Terry Silvers had a long criminal record of prescription pill and meth abuse, including drug arrests in Towns County. Knowing him is probably meth. That's what somebody else was just saying. Uh, That's what they're complaining about. I'm not doing anything. I can't. I don't have any, any indicators. Towns County has a drug problem. The highest number of ER visits per capita for opioid 
overdoses in the state of Georgia. State records show Deputy Greg Joseph attended a full day drug impairment class just a week before he relied solely on this HGN test to clear silvers, a test that cannot detect opioids or meth. Take a deep breath, bro. That's good. Thank you. This is Deputy Joseph testing Terry Silvers at yet another one car crash the night before the fatal collision. Mr. Silvers, how many wrecks are you going to have on this road? See my finger? Mm -hmm. Follow your eyes only, okay? No, that blue zero's on the box, and I can't find anything on HGN. That's the citation number? No, that's the case number for the report. I'm sorry I had to call you out like this. Well, I'd rather come out here and do this than having to pick your body up somewhere. No, that's right. He's turning in cornerstone right now. 24 hours later. That's the siren of the same deputy's car passing the gas station where Terry Silvers had stopped right before the fatal collision. All units, be on the lookout for a small white Toyota truck. It's going to be occupied by a silver subject. The car advised reckless driving. Towns County 911 didn't dispatch Deputy Joseph, who kept driving away to back up another deputy and a Hiawassee officer on what turned out to be an unfounded intruder call. I was just wanting to call you and say... Really? What? What did I do? As soon as we get out and start clearing the house, y'all give out a bolo? Yeah, I know. Well, now he's dead. What? Now he's dead. What do you mean, now he's dead? Well, he wrecked, and now he's dead. Well, dang it. I feel like I'm living in a living nightmare. In a situation like this, seconds count. Yeah. The only people who could help in this case were driving the other way. Yeah. I told God I'm Mary! Don't let somebody else have to experience what I've gone through. <laughs> We'll never know what was in the driver's blood. The medical examiner tested Silvers only for alcohol, not drugs. Towns County has the highest number of ER visits for opioid overdoses per capita in the state of Georgia. After FetcherNews.com first broke this story, the State Training Academy announced special training in Hiawassee and Towns County, but not a single deputy signed up. All right, thanks a lot, Brendan. While some folks out there might pray the police lose their information, a recent hack on the Georgia State Patrol is causing a major headache for a woman who's already dealing with the fallout from a car crash. And don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break.
If you've ever been in an accident, you know most insurance companies, they ask for a police report before they offer assistance. But what happens when the agency has been hacked so the report no longer exists? It's part of the continuing fallout from the Georgia State Patrol ransomware attack. Joe Henke talked to one driver struggling to get help. I had to go out and purchase a vehicle, you know, to get back and forth to work. The damage does not look bad on the surface, only a bent up rear bumper. But Willie Turner says a crash in July damaged her car's axle, totaling the used vehicle, and the crash also injured her hip and back. You know, when they hit me, they hit me so hard, you mean, I mean, they just, it knocked me forward. The car knocked the car forward. Turner says it happened on Interstate 20 westbound near Temple. After her car stalled in the right lane, Turner remembers calling 911 for help. A car stopped short of hitting hers, but then she says a MARTA police vehicle hit the van behind her, slamming it into her car. She blames the driver who hit the van, but is searching for answers of how to get a crash report so her insurance will let her file a claim. Right now, she is stuck with unanswered questions. What they mean, they no longer exist. This accident, this accident happened. Turner says at the scene, the only information she received was this piece of paper from the state trooper. It shows a report number, the trooper's name, and details of how drivers can usually request copies of reports, but no details of what happened. Turner's accident happened on July 25th. Today, a spokeswoman with the Georgia State Patrol told 11 Alive reports from July 23rd through part of July 26th no longer exist and were lost following a ransomware attack. Turner says she has called and went to GSP offices numerous times but got nowhere. A martyr spokeswoman confirmed one of its police vehicles was involved in the crash, but they're still reviewing the case and haven't been able to get a copy of the state patrol crash report either. Turner says she tried hiring an attorney to represent her, but they wouldn't take her case without a report on file. Ah, what a lovely day it was today. And now we're looking at the weekend just ahead, and it looks like we're going to see some changes over the course of the weekend. We have the rain coming in Friday. It looks pretty showery in nature. And then Saturday, we're going to be mostly cloudy, so we get a nice break the first half of the weekend. And then the second half of the weekend, the rain returns, about a 30% chance. So that could affect some of our tailgating this weekend across much of uh, the Atlanta area. So first, we have the SEC Championship. And that will, of course, be at 4 o'clock on Saturday. And that's when we'll see the cloudy skies, temperatures in the 50s. No problem there. It's, in fact, just impeccable uh, weather for tailgating for early December. We know we have had some nasty, cold, rainy SEC championships. And the next day, conditions go down downhill just a little bit here as the folks uh, head to the Falcons game. And it looks like we have about 30% chance of rain developing uh, during the afternoon. So temperatures a little cooler, too, on Sunday. But overall, not bad for the beginning of December because it can be very extreme in terms of temperatures and what kind of cold rain that we can get around here. So let's take a look at the weather pattern and how it's going to be changing as we head into this weekend. We have high pressure in control right now and that's keeping things nice for us across most of the southeast for our Thursday. It's going to be looking great. Temperatures warming up a little bit uh, due to that high pressure as it pushes to the east and as it does push to the east this frontal system is getting more organized and this is going to kind of zip right across the southern third of the nation and head in our direction. So on Friday, we'll expect to see the return of the rain. So the winds have been really gusty this week. Even today, earlier, we had some gusts up around 26 miles per hour in Atlanta, 29 miles per hour in Gainesville. So I think those breezes will be uh, weaker as we head into tomorrow. We're not expecting the winds to be quite as strong on Thursday. So we're going to continue that warm up. Winds won't be as strong. It's going to be a really nice day. Showers move in on Friday, but we think it's pretty much going to be uh, afternoon and evening, not so much in the morning like we originally thought during Canathon. And then the rain's going to return Sunday. It'll be light to start, and then Monday and Tuesday look like they could be fairly wet. So high pressure's in control for now. We're going to see that front moving in from the west, and that's going to return the rain here by uh, Friday afternoon. So this is Friday right at lunchtime, and then we'll see that rain moving in Friday during the afternoon at around 3 o'clock. 
and during the evening as well. So the timing on that specifically showing that rain moving in during the afternoon on Friday. So I think mostly dry for Canathon and then we'll see a few showers scooting through during the afternoon and evening on our Friday. Nothing too widespread. That widespread rain is going to come in as we head into the beginning of the week and it looks like we could see some pretty healthy amounts across northwest Georgia. So this is what we're looking at Thursday. A very nice day coming our way. 40% chance of rain on Friday, mainly showers, and we think Canathon will be mostly dry. Saturday looks wonderful, mostly cloudy skies though, but nice temperatures. Sunday, a little cooler, a little wetter, and it looks quite a bit wetter for Monday and Tuesday of next week. Well, the Braves have stayed pretty busy this offseason. There are multiple reports that say the club signed Cole Hamels to a one-year deal worth $18 million earlier today. Now, Hamels had a 3.81 ERA and 27 starts with the Cubs in 2019 and will turn 36 later this month. Alex Glaze and Flowery Branch for the Falcons are getting ready to host the Carolina Panthers this weekend. Now, the big news that sent shockwaves throughout the league yesterday was David Tepper, the Carolina Panthers owner, deciding to fire head coach Ron Rivera midweek and with just four games remaining in the regular season. The Panthers will be playing at the Benz in a couple of days. Falcons head coach Dan Quinn says the coaching change won't alter how the Falcons prepare for the Panthers. They've got a rock solid, you know, program, foundation, philosophy of how they do things. So uh, much like when a new quarterback comes in, there will be some tweaks uh, to it, you would think, but not wholesale as it goes. Now, Sunday's game will be a special one for Falcons legend Roddy White. He'll be inducted into the Falcons ring of honor. He says it'll be a special moment for him and his family. He says Arthur Blank and the Falcons changed his life when they drafted him with the 27th overall pick back in 2005. Just holding my jersey and my mom was like to write, my brother was like, it's like a, it's like I still got that picture in my house and it's just, every time I walk by it, it just kind of brings chills to me because um, that was the day my life changed. And that's your look at sports.
All right, months of hard work went into crafting a tribute to veterans. So this weekend coming, we'll unveil a brand new memorial in Forsyth County. Sculptor Gregory Johnson oversaw the installation of this uh, monumental piece this week. The three-piece bronze statue requires some heavy machinery just to get each figure in place. Johnson says his work tells the legacy of humanity in times of war. Well, it looks pretty good for our Thursday at 10 on the Wazometer. Temperatures a little warmer than today. Friday, it looks like showers move in during right around the lunch hour and continue off and on throughout the afternoon and early evening. Then we dry out for Saturday, and then the rain returns Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of next week. All right, we are rolling on. We'll see you right back here at 10. <laughs> Live from Atlanta, 11 Alive at 10 on the ATL starts now. And we have new details about a family tragedy in Rockdale County. Three members of one family found shot to death at a home in Conyers. Tonight, we're learning more about the two youngest victims. As John Sherrick explains for us tonight, their deaths are leaving the community reeling. The family, together in this photo posted on Jackie Terry's Facebook page, her son Josh Baker, 19, her daughter Jada Curry, 25, and Jada's husband Michael Curry, 50, now all three gone. All three shot to death found Monday inside the home where Jada and Michael and their two-year-old son lived in Conyers. Jada and Josh, close siblings, their deaths ruled homicides. Rockdale County's sheriff is not saying yet whether it was Jada 
Jada's husband, Michael, who killed Jada and Josh and then killed himself. Family friends stunned. One posting this GoFundMe page on behalf of Jackie Terry, who lost both of her children, to help her and her now orphaned grandson. The friend writes, Jada, a beautiful and doting mom of MJ, two years old. Josh was a star in high school theater at North Springs Charter High in Sandy Springs. Had just started college with a quick wit, big smile, and gracious heart. What happened in this family? Investigators going only so far as to say their deaths may be the result of a domestic dispute inside the home. An isolated incident, meaning they believe it's likely that no one else was involved. A family tragedy and a whole community of loved ones in tears. A horrific scene at Lee Street in Campbellton Road in southwest Atlanta. That's where police say an armed carjacking led to police chasing a person that ended in a deadly crash. Officers say two innocent people were killed when the suspects crashed into their car after running a red light. A total of five cars were involved in the wreck. Anytime a deadly crash happens during a police chase, we get questions about whether police should have been pursuing the car. In this case, police say they were following proper protocol. Investigators say because they knew the car had been stolen in the carjacking and the suspects were armed. Well, this was a pursuit. I mean, it does fall within our uh, standard operating procedure. We don't chase everyone. We're very strict on who we allow our officers to chase. In this case, since the vehicle was taken by gunpoint, it was a carjacking. We did allow the chase to continue. Police say the two suspects are 19 years old. They were injured and are now in custody. Gwinnett County Police are investigating a deadly crash involving a school bus crash. And this happened near Puckett's Mill Road and Hamilton Mill. Video from 11 Alive Sky Tracker shows the damaged bus and an SUV. The driver in the SUV died. Police are looking into whether that driver had a medical emergency. The school bus was carrying special education students from Ivy Creek Elementary School. None of the children were hurt. It's an iconic name throughout Georgia, but tonight several Georgia State students say a century old mo monument of Henry Grady should be removed. In an editorial that has now gone viral, the students say Grady is a racist who shouldn't be celebrated. Ryan Kruger shows us how a new state law means that's not likely to happen. At a busy intersection downtown, a southern gentleman keeps watch. You ever heard of uh, Henry Grady? Uh, no. His monument describes him as a journalist, orator, and patriot. But some students at Georgia State have different words to describe him. He was a racist. There is no denying that. Anyone who's denying that is lying to themselves. Hamza Rahman is the Student Government Association Vice President at Georgia State. It tells me that I don't belong here sometimes. Um, this is my home and I should be able to look at it without seeing a man who would have hated my presence here everywhere. As the former managing editor of the Atlanta Constitution, Grady wrote headlines described as racist, called the white race superior, and supported white supremacist politicians. The GSU student paper, The Signal, published a scathing editorial calling for Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms to get rid of the Henry Grady statue downtown and move it to the Atlanta History Center. Legally speaking, the city's hands are tied. A new state law says historical monuments in Georgia can't be moved, changed, or hidden. Besides, many people argue history can't be removed or ignored. I, mean, I can see why they would want to tear it down. Yeah, yeah, that's, but at the same time, it's a piece of history, I guess. The editors at the student paper tell me they're surprised they've received such attention. They're hoping this starts a dialogue about one of the most famous names in Georgia. The one thing I would like to see is Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms be an active participant in that because we haven't heard from her yet. And neither have we. I reached out to the mayor's office. They didn't get back to me for a comment on this story. We did put a link to that editorial on our website. It's 11alive.com. Former President Jimmy Carter was released from the hospital in Plains, Georgia today. The 95-year-old was being treated for a urinary tract infection. He's been in and out of the hospital several times this year. Carter recently underwent surgery at Emory for a brain bleed after falling multiple times just in the past few months. No one will fight harder for our state, for our nation, for our president, and for our conservative values. Because here's the thing, contrary to what you might see in the media, not every strong American woman is a liberal. Many of us are conservatives and proud of it. Businesswoman Kelly Leffler is Governor Brian Kemp's appointee for the U.S. Senate. Today she introduced herself to Georgia. 
She addressed skepticism and criticism right off the bat, saying she is in line with President Trump's agenda. This was the first time that anyone has heard from Ms. Leffler, so there is a lot to talk about. Here's Doug Richards. Our next U.S. Senator, Kelly Leffler. She is on the tall side, admittedly soft-spoken. Politically, she is a blank slate. But Kelly Leffler's story emerged in an overcrowded room at the state capitol with a national audience watching. I'm a defender of the American dream and of American ideals. I want to fight socialism side by side with President Trump. Leffler talked up conservatism, saying she's pro-life, pro-economic freedom, and pro-Donald Trump. The president had tried to talk Governor Kemp into appointing Congressman Doug Collins instead to the U.S. Senate seat to be vacated this month by Johnny Isaacson. And Collins had backing from talk show host Sean Hannity and Atlanta Tea Party founder Debbie Dooley, who talked to us last week. I think what would play in the hands of the Democrats would be for him to appoint Kelly Loeffler. Folks like me will refuse to vote for her, period. Really? Yes. Really. But Kemp and other backers urged critics to get to know Leffler before judging her. Settle down, learn the truth and the facts, and really see how strong uh, this woman is and what a great job she's going to do for us in Washington, D.C. My name is Kelly Leffler. I'm a devoted wife, a proud patriot, and a devout Christian. Leffler told the room she'd grown up on a farm and waited tables before she got into the financial industry and married Jeff Sprecher, who is reportedly worth a half billion dollars and owns the New York Stock Exchange. It's that waitress that's looking to go from waiting tables to working in industry or doing whatever she wants to do in life. I want to make sure we keep that path clear and keep socialism back and, and live what we're living right now and preserve it and build on it. Another trial date is set for R. Kelly in a series of sexual abuse cases. Trials were already scheduled for the R&B singer in federal courts in Chicago in April, in Brooklyn in May, and now a Cook County judge in Illinois has ordered Kelly to stand trial in September. The judge is also asking prosecutors which of the four sexual abuse cases they intend to take to trial first. Kelly is currently being held without bail if convicted in all these cases, he could spend the rest of his life in prison. A couple relieved to be home tonight after getting stuck in a private Mexican hospital for weeks. A cruise trip turning into a medical emergency with the hospital requiring them to pay up to entirely the whole bill there before they could leave the hospital. But they couldn't afford the $16,000 bill until a famous Georgian stepped in. Caitlin Ross is the only reporter in town speaking to the couple now that they're out of the hospital again. The last picture Stephen and Tori have of themselves smiling is from the plane ride. As soon as I was on the ship, I was not feeling well. The day they boarded the ship, Stephen got so sick, the cruise line had to fly him to a private hospital in Progreso, Mexico. It was only after getting treatment for a week, they found out he owed the full amount up front. They brought him the bill of $14,000 mm -hmm. and said, you know, you don't pay, you don't leave. The couple says the hospital confiscated their passports and things got physical when they tried to leave. They literally assaulted him. Please tell him how far you walked. Uh, oh, it was like, it was a total of six miles. In flip-flops. The hospital told NBC News it's standard for private hospitals to collect payment at the time of service, and they didn't do anything wrong. These people are really serious. Stephen's fiance Tori, put their plea on Facebook, where thousands of people reacted to their story. Without Tori, I'll probably still be in Mexico. I wouldn't have reached out to Facebook. But it was one particular viewer who made the difference. Tyler Perry saw the couple struggle and reached out directly to pay their bill. I think I repeated his name about 15 times. I couldn't believe it at all. Perry paid $16,000 to get the couple home and covered their airfare. They both say they are so thankful for Perry's generosity and kindness and for each other. I had to pull up my bootstraps and be, and be his rock. You know, for so long he's been mine, you know, now it's time for me to be his. Rebuilding Paris on Ponce, it was about 100 years ago, a mattress uh, manufacturing plant. And customers at this Atlanta store are helping the owners bounce back after a devastating fire. Paris on Ponce hopes to raise $100,000 to reopen the antique boutique. Say that three times, Aisha, and you're on your own. A fire ripped through the 100-year-old building the night before Thanksgiving. The store on Ponce has already raised more than $14,000 
if you wonder where it is, it's right across from uh, the uh, the market there, Pond City Market, and it's on the Belt Line. All right, I'll check it out. Uh, really nice weather heading our way again tomorrow like we had today. But as we head towards the end of the week, we're going to see another system moving in, bringing in a few showers as we wrap up our work week. And there's a couple more systems behind it that will bring in wet weather for next week. So we'll be talking more about the timing of the rain coming up. Today, four witnesses gave their expert opinions on the Constitution and its provisions for the impeachment. The three things you need to know from the hearing coming up. And don't forget the 11 Alive Canathon, only two days away. Every year we team up with the Salvation Army and collect canned food to help Georgia families in need. You can help us on Friday. We'd love to meet with you in person. We're going to be at several locations all across the metro. Head to 11alive.com slash canathon for a list of those locations. If you can't make it out, our live coverage begins on 11 Alive at 4.30 a.m. We have some new information just in. Lockdown has been lifted at the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard in Hawaii after three people were shot. Military officials say that a gunman, believed to be a U.S. sailor, shot the Defense Department employees. It forced the base into lockdown for about two hours. Authorities say the gunman later shot and killed himself. We are working to learn about the conditions of the victims as well. This shooting happened just three days before the anniversary of the 1941 Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The House Judiciary Committee held its first public hearings today with four witnesses giving their expert opinions on the Constitution and its provisions for impeachment. Jennifer Bellamy joins us now with a look at the top things you need to know about today's hearings. Another day, another impeachment proceeding on Capitol Hill. The testimony from constitutional scholars wasn't unanimous, but not for the reason you might think. Nearly all of the witnesses, three law school professors, agree that there is enough evidence to impeach President Trump from last month's Intelligence Committee hearings. They say it shows the president did commit high crimes and misdemeanors. A president should resist foreign interference in our elections, not demand it and not welcome it. After reviewing the evidence that's been made public, I cannot help but conclude that this president has attacked each of the Constitution's safeguards against establishing a monarchy in this country. Only one professor argued that in this case, impeachment is wrong. But that opinion wasn't based on what President Trump did or did not do. It was due to the fact that the case is not complete and he felt the process was being rushed. It's wrong because this is not how you impeach an American president. This case is not a case of the unknowable. It's a case of the peripheral. We have a record of conflicts defenses that have not been fully considered, unsubpoenaed witness with material evidence. To impeach a president on this record would expose every future president to the same type of inchoate impeachment. 
The White House refused an invitation for the president and his attorneys to take part in the day's proceedings. The hearings unfolding while President Trump was out of the country, participating in the NATO summit in London. They have not ruled out participating in the future. And if the Judiciary Committee decides that the president's actions do constitute high crimes and misdemeanors, it will then draw up articles of impeachment. That will then trigger a full vote by members of the House. We are joined by meteorologist Samantha Moore now as we make our way toward the midpoint of the week. We start focusing on the weekend, the SEC championship around the corner. And we're going to have a lot of friends here from Louisiana visiting. <laughs> what can they expect? Friends? Is that what we call them? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> we're, we're all SEC brothers and sisters. That's true. That is true. Although sometimes uh, kinfolk don't get along too well on the holidays, <laughs> right? Well, um, Mike Sussman in Gainesville, he's one of our 11 Alive Storm trackers. He, tracked the, he uh, posted this great post of sunset once again. It's been a great week for sunsets if you've had the chance to catch them. They've been brilliant. So that was from his place in Gainesville. Looking out over the Atlanta Braves battery, the tree is up, the lights are on. There have been a lot of folks milling around out there. And overall, a very nice middle of the week. But changes are indeed heading our way as we head into the next uh, 36 hours or so. So let's talk about the winds. The winds have been gusty once again today, up around 26 miles per hour in Atlanta, 25 in Athens. 29 miles per hour in Gainesville, up there where Mike Sussman is, and 20 miles per hour in Rome. So definitely some gusty winds. I think they'll be slackening overnight tonight, however. So 60 was our high, 35 our low. We should be around 57 and 39 this time of year. Records for the date, 76 back at 98. That was a hot one and a chilly one back in 1895 with a low of 16. Far from that today, that's good. And we have seven and three quarters inches deficit as far as rainfall goes. So we do need the rain and we are gonna get maybe an inch and a half to two and a half inches by the time we get to Tuesday. So as far as our temps right now, it's gonna be a little bit milder overnight, not quite as chilly tomorrow morning. We're at 48 in Athens right now, 48 in Canton, 50 in Rome. So we're running about 10 degrees warmer in Carrollton, close to that in Atlanta, eight degrees warmer than we were 24 hours ago in Marietta. And Rome is really warmer. Uh, they're at 16 degrees warmer than they were at this time yesterday. So everyone will be feeling a little bit warmer tomorrow. And the next 12 hours will be dipping down into the low 40s and upper 30s as we head into the early morning hours. So on your Thursday, you can expect to see a really nice day at hand, a 10 on the wasometer with temperatures starting out in the upper 30s, getting up into the low 60s. So we'll see that gradual warm up continuing. Showers will make a reappearance on our Canathon Friday. We were worried about them coming in early earlier in the day, but I think it's going to be a little later, so we should be able to get most of the food drive in before the showers move in. And the first half of the weekend is dry. It's going to be the second half. We're going to be tracking rain. Nothing on the radar right now. The sweep is clean. We're looking out across the eastern U.S. High pressure is our dominant weather feature. That cold winter weather maker still spinning around the northeast, though. That's the one that brought in all our wind and our cool air. The next system is all the way over in the desert southwest. That's going to be heading in our direction by Friday. And it looks pretty showery out there. It's going to be pretty showery here, though. No, no big soaking rain to start the weekend off with. So here's the timing. We'll see those clouds around as we head into Friday, but I think no rain until probably right around uh, midday, maybe in Carrollton, just very light to start, very spotty even early Friday afternoon. Rome may be seeing some heavier downpours, maybe into Carrollton later on in the afternoon, and then that kind of pushes off to the south, and we see a little bit of a break in the action. So rainfall amounts look like they'll be very light to start, most likely less than a quarter of an inch or so on our Friday, and then we'll see the heavier amounts moving in late Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So enjoy Thursday. It's going to be terrific. A 10 on the wasometer. Canathon, we have a chance for those showers during the afternoon and early evening, and those dry out for Saturday, so mostly cloudy for Saturday. Temperatures a little cooler. Sunday, 30% chance of rain, and then a 50% chance on our Monday and Tuesday, and very cold temperatures behind oh, yeah. that. Well, so many people spend money on Cyber Monday. It's putting some stress on companies working to send out those packages to the right place on time. If you are sending out packages and you want them to get there before the holidays, here's some deadlines for you. For standard shipping, the last day you can ship is December 13th for UPS, the 14th for the Postal Service, and the 16th for FedEx. For that two-day shipping, UPS and FedEx will need your boxes by the 20th. And for overnight shipping, the deadline for all three is December 20th. 23rd.
I'm Francesca Amaker with the A scene. Marvel's Phase 4 is set to begin next year. And first up, Scar Jo, you know, Scarlett Johansson in Black Widow. I have all the details about the new trailer that just dropped. It's coming up in the A scene. All right, folks, you know what time it is. You see your screen. It is time for Wednesday's edition of the A-Scene, and we are kicking off with the debut of the highly anticipated Georgia filmed Black Widow. Mm -hmm. It's a Marvel movie, and everyone's talking about it. The trailer, which is the first film in phase four of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, just dropped. I mean, wow. Scarlett Johansson reprises her role as Natasha or Black Widow. She meets up with her sis, Yelena, played by Florence Pugh, and the rest of her assassin family, including David Harbour, you know, his Red Guardian, and Rachel Wise's character, Melina. Together, the family goes back to where it all started to take down whatever evil threat lurks in the distance. And keep in mind, actor David Harbour, who was also star in uh, Stranger Things, was in Georgia back in September filming both of these projects. We showed you the photo then. Black Widow comes out. May 2020. Okay, now I have a, a huge announcement. We are having a baby shower. Well, I'm not, but the cast of Doom Patrol is filming a baby shower scene, and you can be in it, so catch this casting. This is for season two, and filming goes down on Monday, December 9th in Conyers. Casting directors are looking for five women of all ethnicities, ages 28 to 38, to portray besties of the mother-to-be. So if you've already booked with, you know, the Doom Patrol series, they don't want you to submit. But you can only submit if you have a car that is not red, white, or black. And for more of the A-Scene folks, head on over to our website to see what's filming in your neck of the woods, 11alive.com slash the a -Scene. A new report raising some eyebrows nationwide. It is linking popular products used by many women to cancer. We will tell you about it coming up next.
If you have ever been involved in an accident, you know that most insurance companies ask for a police report before they can offer assistance. But what happens when the agency has been hacked? So that report, it no longer exists. It's part of the continuing fallout from the Georgia State Patrol ransomware attack. Joe Hankey talked to one driver struggling to get help. I had to go out and purchase a vehicle, you know, to get back and forth to work. The damage does not look bad on the surface, only a bent up rear bumper. But Willie Turner says a crash in July damaged her car's axle, totaling the used vehicle, and the crash also injured her hip and back. You know, when they hit me, they hit me so hard, you know, I mean, they just, it knocked me forward. The car knocked the car forward. Turner says it happened on Interstate 20 westbound near Temple. After her car stalled in the right lane, Turner remembers calling 911 for help. A car stopped short of hitting hers, but then she says a MARTA police vehicle hit the van behind her, slamming it into her car. She blames the driver who hit the van, but is searching for answers of how to get a crash report so her insurance will let her file a claim. Right now, she is stuck with unanswered questions. What they mean, they no longer exist. This accident, this accident happened. Turner says at the scene, the only information she received was this piece of paper from the state trooper. It shows a report number, the trooper's name, and details of how drivers can usually request copies of reports, but no details of what happened. Turner's accident happened on July 25th. Today, a spokeswoman with the Georgia State Patrol told 11 Alive reports from July 23rd through part of July 26th no longer exist and were lost following a ransomware attack. Turner says she has called and went to GSP offices numerous times but got nowhere. An update now on the hug that so many people saw and had opinions on. 18 year old Brent Jean hugged Dallas officer Amber Geiger after a judge sentenced her for killing Brant's older brother. Geiger claimed that she walked into his apartment by mistake and shot Jean, thinking he was an intruder. The jury rejected that defense, and now Brandt is receiving an award for his gesture during the emotional trial. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. It's an award 18-year-old Brandt Jean never expected. I never intended for the statement I made to the person that murdered my brother to receive such international recognition. That recognition came two months ago after the sentencing of former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Yes. John shocked the courtroom by leaving the stand during his victim impact statement for a most unlikely embrace. Geiger had just been sentenced to 10 years in prison for murdering John's older brother, Botham, in his own apartment. She said she mistook him for a burglar. I felt free um, knowing that Amber Geiger knew I forgave her. At the time, the moment stunned the world, including his mother. Did you expect that at all? I didn't expect it at all. I didn't know what he was going to do. Now, the Institute for Law Enforcement Administration is honoring Brant Jean with its Ethical Courage Award. Ms. Geiger needed to be forgiven, and I needed to be free from the burden of unforgiveness. He left. The family's attorney, Lee Merritt, hoped Jean's forgiveness sends a larger message. The law enforcement community now has a responsibility as, as a result of that forgiveness, and they have a responsibility to humanize uh, black males in our society. Dozens of police officers attended the award ceremony. John used that opportunity to call for better training within the department. But this was his most direct message. I want you all to know that I am not a threat, that young black males are not inherently dangerous or criminal. Sometimes actions speak much louder than words. I believe it was honoring both of them because it is something he would have wanted to portray. George Zimmerman is now suing the family of Trayvon Martin for $100 million. The lawsuit comes after the release of a new book and documentary, which claims false evidence was used at the trial. Zimmerman's team is seeking $100 million in damages from several defendants involved in the case, including Trayvon's parents. Zimmerman, who was a neighborhood watch coordinator, shot and killed the 17-year-old in 2012. He claimed self-defense, but was found not guilty in that trial. A former officer has pleaded not guilty to choking a former NFL player during a traffic stop in June. The grand jury indicted former Henry County officer David Rose on charges of violating his oath, simple battery, and making a false statement. 
Former NFL player who had an opportunity to make the Buccaneers roster, Desmond Merrow, claims that Rose and another officer tackled him and choked him while he was handcuffed. Rose was later fired. The department says it is because his report of what happened didn't match what they saw in the video. There is an epidemic of package thefts going on all across America, millions of them. NBC's Miguel Almaguer tonight on how some people are now fighting back. Faster than they arrived, packages can disappear. Tonight, porch pirates are striking across the country, just as a record number of Cyber Monday deliveries are being made. Captured on camera, but not always caught by police, the New York Times says nationwide, more than 1.7 million packages are stolen or go missing every day. 90,000 in New York City alone, an astonishing $25 million in lost goods and services across the country. It just felt good to feel like we got some sort of justice. Near St. Louis, one family who wants to remain anonymous fought back after they say this woman took their packages twice. Homeowners leaving a package full of dirty diapers, which was stolen the next day. She got the special surprise for my daughter. With porch pirates on the prowl, some police stations are now offering to accept packages under their Christmas trees. And we hold them here safe. And that, you know, definitely, you know, relieves a lot of anxiety for our citizens. There are ways to ensure you get what you paid for. Sign up to track your packages, require a signature on delivery, and if you can, get them sent somewhere secure, like your office. This holiday season, it is good to give, but also to receive. The worst kept secret in Georgia politics revealed today. Governor Kemp introducing Kelly Leffler as his pick for the U.S. Senate seat to replace the retiring Johnny Isaacson. Joining me right now is national columnist Ron Hart. And we want to talk about that Senate pick right now. A yeah. month ago, that might have been very surprising. But there yeah. has been a forward inertia on all of this where nobody was surprised today. Yeah, a pushback against Trump, also some calculation on, on the part of the governor because women have kind of been fleeing a little bit the Republican Party in the suburbs, so a woman candidate would be good. Only the second woman senator from, from uh, Georgia in our history. The first one was in 1922, if you can believe that. Are you surprised that Governor Kemp would stand up to President Trump on this issue? I mean, he was very strong and stout. Uh, yeah, Representative Collins. Well, good for him. If he likes the, if he likes Kelly, he should put her in there. I think he, uh, Trump is, uh, you know, he can bully people a little bit. I think uh, Kemp did himself well standing up to him. So it's his decision. He makes a decision. It's not patronage. It's not uh, a situation that Trump has much say in. How rowdy do you think 2020 is going to be when we get to the winter and the Democrats slugging it out in the snow of New Hampshire and Iowa? Yeah, 76 year old people walking through the snow. It could be dangerous <laughs> in New Hampshire. You know, they're, they're, they're this awkward age where they're too. Uh, they're, they're too too old for Snapchat. They're too young for busy, <laughs> busy angels, you know. So um, and life alerts. So they got these old people. That's what I like about the Leffler woman. She's 49. She could be there a long time. A subject you and I like to talk about is student debt, student yeah. loan, <laughs> the value of college. Yeah. Some people should go to college. Some people should not. But that's not acceptable in our culture. Sure. It's, a, it, you know, it's an article of faith that your kids should go to college. And too many people take on too much debt to send their kids to colleges that don't educate them very well. And the quality of the education, look, you know, I was a gender studies major in college back when there was only two of them. I, I'd have to go back right now and get re-educated. <laughs> I had a hot water heater that was replaced by a guy in July, and, and I was hanging around talking to him, and he said he will make six figures this year. And yeah. that the company that he worked for couldn't find enough talent, sure. enough help to be able to fill the holes that they had. People go to Georgetown, where I went for a while, and uh, basically pay 70000 bucks a year to study English, a language they already know. <laughs> Political science. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think maybe half the people should be in college. The cost has gone up a lot, twice the rate of inflation. It's priced itself out, out of the market as a value proposition. And a lot of families really need to sit down and think, is it worth taking on debt and send we, my kid to college? We're going to have to have a cultural change for that to happen. Sure. Well, we have to value hard work and, and, and gritty jobs. Right. We tend to, you know, you, you read Chaucer on your own time. I mean, you don't have to pay 40, <laughs> 50 grand a year to go do that. All right, let's talk about the SEC championship game here, LSU, Georgia. Ticket prices have gone down a little bit, surprisingly enough. You think it would be big, but it's not. Essentially a home game in many ways for uh, Georgia, but LSU fans tend to show up, and did they're see, rowdy. Do you see the amount of money that Kirby Smart will collect if they win this game on Saturday? It, it's a king's ransom, man. Yeah. It's, it's 
unbelievable how much money is out there for coaches of these great programs. Now. And if you, you look at studies like Saban, the money they spent for uh, Nick Saban in Alabama is paid off in tuition, increased enrollment. There is a mathematical right. calculus in it that works for the school. Ron Hart, thank you. Your 11 Alive Storm Trackers have been talking about what a great night it is to do a little stargazing, and it's one I even saw a shooting star, and we have reports coming in of uh, Meteor and uh, Marietta, also in Cloudland in Northwest Georgia. So coming up, we'll talk a little bit more about the Geminids and when the rain is going to make its return. Coming up in sports, it is the Hot Stove League. Here goes, Braves spending some money. Not a bad thing for a player is a little bit older, but this is a good deal. One year deal. We'll tell you about that coming up. With record-breaking sales on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, the demand for on-time delivery, it's at an all-time high. Not only will there be more packages to deliver this year, but the holiday shopping season is shorter. So, on top of finding those gifts faster, you are also facing a time crunch to get them to the right place on time. NBC's Vicki Wynn has all we need to know about shipping, including how to protect your packages.
With only three weeks until Christmas, the clock is ticking to get those gifts on time. This holiday season, companies are expected to deliver more than 2 billion packages. So what are the shipping deadlines to get your gifts to arrive on time? For standard shipping, the last day you can ship is December 13th for UPS, the 14th for the Postal Service, and the 16th for FedEx. For two-day shipping, UPS and FedEx will need your boxes by the 20th. For priority shipping, the Postal Service cutoff is the 21st. And for overnight shipping, the deadline for all three is December 23rd. That date also applies to Amazon orders for Prime members. But getting those deliveries to your front door is only half the battle. Watch out for thieves who are working overtime this holiday. Porch pirates across the country caught on camera, like this guy making a getaway just days ago with three packages at once. This woman, too, jetting off with a stolen box. So what can you do to protect your purchase? Set delivery alerts for every package you ship. That way you get an email or a text right to your phone letting you know when the package ships and when it arrives. You can also select signature required on the shipping label so your package isn't left on an empty porch. Another possibility, have your packages shipped to your office. That way you can be sure someone is always on the receiving end. Or you can have it delivered to a trusted neighbor. And get the extra insurance, especially if you have an expensive package. It's only a few dollars more and it can really save you if your package is lost or damaged. For example, if you're shipping through FedEx and your package is worth $300, you can insure the entire amount for just $2. And one more thing to note, the number of boxes coming your way for the holidays. If you have the choice and the time, opt to get your items delivered in as few packages as possible. That way there's less waste and less for you to track. Whether you're shipping across town or across the country, simple tips to get those packages home in time for the holidays. So let the cola wars begin again after being shut out of last year's Super Bowl in its hometown. Coca-Cola is making a return for Super Bowl 54, according to Variety. Coca-Cola bought a 60-second slot to air during the game on February 2nd. How much would that cost? A Fox executive said it was seeking more than $5 million for a 30-second ad. You do the math on that one, my oh my. Last year... Here in their hometown, Coca-Cola ended its 11-year run of Super Bowl appearances thanks to an ad blitz from Pepsi. That kicked off the unofficial Cola Wars. Pepsi, the sponsor of Super Bowl 53 in Atlanta, but Coke had the pouring rights inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium. The two made slight digs at each other in both local advertising and on social media. Coca-Cola has a, a memorable history of Super Bowl ads, one featuring Mean Joe Green and who can forget those polar bears. Fox executives say it's already sold out all commercial inventory for the game. Inventory is still up for grabs pre and post game though, and that will cost around $3 million. Well, our 11 Alive storm tracker page came to life a little while ago as we had several storm trackers talking about seeing bright fireballs in the sky. And so it is the time for the Geminid meteor shower. It will get a little bit more impressive as we head into next week. So it'll peak on December 13th and 14th. But we have had a few people see some very low bright white uh, fireballs over the horizon. Um, we had uh, Bob. Um, Hegenberger and also um, I think it was oh goodness one of our other great storm trackers commenting about how they saw that bright light right around 840 in the evening and so this will be something you will just want to look for when you're out and about uh, at night the next couple of nights especially tomorrow night we should be fairly cloud free like we are right now uh, folks are out looking at Christmas lights so maybe they'll be able to see some of mother nature's uh, lights as well in the night sky. So radar is dry. There is no rain in anywhere around us and there are some clouds out there, but they're high thin clouds. So that apparently didn't keep people from uh, observing these uh, fireballs over the horizon. So high pressure is in place and that made for these nice, mostly clear skies tonight. And our next system comes in on Friday. It's still all the way over in Arizona. It's going to be moving to the east the next uh, 36 hours or so and it'll bring in that chance of rain on Friday, most likely after the noon hour, we're thinking. So we're going to continue to warm up through Thursday. We'll have showers moving in on our Friday, and then that rain returns Sunday, maybe during the afternoon through Tuesday. So we're going to see a big change in the weather pattern. It'll be a whole lot wetter. So as far as tonight, things are nice and clear. A few clouds from time to time as we head into Thursday morning. Getting into Thursday night, the clouds start to thicken up during the 
late evening, but you still may be able to catch some of those Geminids. Who knows? You may be lucky. Getting into Friday morning, it's Canathon time, and we'll have clouds to deal with, but I think the rain is most likely going to hold off until a bit, little bit later in the day. So just some really light showers coming in, maybe mid-morning. Hopefully it won't dampen everyone's giving spirit, and then they get a little bit heavier as we head into the afternoon, especially this one line that'll be coming in around Carrollton and then in through uh, middle Georgia as well. So we'll keep our eyes on that as we head into Friday. And then it looks like a better system coming in on Sunday, bringing in a little bit more widespread chances for rain as we head into the beginning of the week as well. So this is Monday and this is Tuesday. And behind that, some very cold air. So we're going to have to watch as that next system moves in and brings in that cold, wet weather. And we could see some decent amounts of rain, especially in far northwest Georgia. They could see maybe two and a half, uh, three and a half inches, possibly in far northwest Georgia. The Atlanta area expecting to see around one and a half to two and a half inches. Uh, combined the next five days and we need that rain. We are well behind so far this year. We're still over seven and three quarter inches behind for the year. So a 10 on your wasometer on Thursday. Uh, we'll have a six on the wasometer Friday. 40% chance for those showers. Saturday's dry but mostly cloudy. Sunday 30% chance and then a 50% chance at the beginning of next week. Sports time on this Wednesday night. The Braves take out the checkbook and they sign another big name in free agency. Cole Hamels comes to town on a one-year deal worth $18 million. He wanted to play for a contender, and he has heard good things about the Braves, as everyone has. I'm good friends with Jeff Frank uh, and I know he, he's around uh, a lot more. Um, you know, I, I, I'm good friends with Ryan Howard. I know he's been down in that area. He's really good friends with Freeman. So those were kind of the guys that were giving me the uh, sort of 411 on the team, and they just had tremendous things to say. All right, season's not that far off. Spring training, right? Sunday, the Falcons will honor one of the franchise's greatest receivers and induct him into the organization's ring of honor. It will be a special day for Roddy White, who spent 11 seasons with the Falcons. Alex Glaze with our story tonight. What's up? What's up, man? Roddy White is all smiles because on Sunday, he'll be inducted into the Falcons' ring of honor, where he'll live forever among some of the greatest to ever play the game. I just feel like it's special. It's a special moment for me and my family and um, my kids and things like that. It's something, you know, that'll be there for the rest of my life. And um, I'm happy. I'm proud about that. White had many special moments during his 11 years with the Falcons, but none will top his first moment as a member of the organization when he was selected with the 27th overall pick in the 2005 draft. The best memory I've ever had was walking into this building, you know, when I got drafted. I just remember, you know, Arthur just sending the jet to come get us and me and my family, me and my mom and my brother getting on the jet, just walking into this building and just holding my jersey. And my mom was like to write, my brother was like, it's like a, it's like I still got that picture in my house and it's just, every time I walk by it, it just kind of brings chills to me because um, that was the day my life changed. These days, Roddy is coaching at Johns Creek High School and today he was asked, if there's a chance of him coaching in the NFL someday, he said right now there is a 0% chance. <laughs> All right, he's being honest, right? Maybe he'll get an opportunity one day. Hawks trying to win two in a row didn't happen. You don't blame Trey Young, though. Another huge night, 39 points and 10 assists. But the Nets more balanced in scoring five players in double figures, and they win 130 to 118. Georgia Tech hosting a game in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Jackets had their way with Nebraska tonight. Michael DeVoe, the hot hand, he had 26 points for the sophomore from uh, Orlando. Not bad. Tech now 4-2 and two on the season. They'll take on Syracuse on Saturday. UGA getting a big win tonight. Anthony Edwards, the Ant-Man, had 21 dogs beat up on North Carolina Central, 95-59. That is sports. We'll wrap things up right after this.
Okie doke. Well, tomorrow looks fantastic. A great day to get out and get a little fresh air. It's going to be beautiful. 10 on the wisometer. Friday, we do have some showers moving in. I think our canathon will be mostly dry. There may be a few light showers. And then more showers coming in during the afternoon and evening. Saturday looks mostly cloudy but dry. Pretty nice for the SEC championship. A lot better than in other years when it was very cold and very wet. It all looks pretty good for December, you know? Not too bad. Not too bad.